My name is Rachel. I knew what was coming. I knew. I'd seen it in Jake's eyes. And you know what? I was scared. I never thought I would be. Cassie thinks I'm fearless. Marco thinks I'm reckless. Tobias. Well, Tobias loves me. <laughs> I guess they all do, in different ways. Jake, too. But Jake had to do the right thing. I felt sorry for him, you know? He's carried the weight so long. He's made hard decisions. None as hard as this, maybe. I didn't blame him, not even for a minute. But I was scared. I guess no one wants to die. I guess everyone is scared when the time comes. We were so close. We were right there, right at the finish line. I'd already survived so many times when I shouldn't have. It seemed unfair to come this far, get this close. Jake gave me the job because he knew that only I could do it, would do it. Axe might have, sure, but he was needed for his skills. Me, I'm not the computer genius. I'm the one you send when you need someone to be crazy, to do the hard thing. I don't know whether I'm proud of that or not. I was Jake's insurance policy. He thought, maybe he wouldn't have to use me. He hoped, anyway. But down deep he knew, and I knew, and we both hid the truth from the others because Cassie couldn't let Jake make that decision, and Tobias couldn't let me, and those two, by loving us, would have screwed everything up. It was a war, after all. A war we had to win. We hadn't asked the Yerks to come to Earth. They made that call on their own. They're a parasitic species, not very big or impressive to look at, just these snail-like things that can enter your head through your ear. They have a capacity to anesthetize the inner ear enough to allow them to burrow through the soft tissue. It still hurts, but not as much as it should. They dig their way straight to your brain and then flatten themselves out, spread themselves down into the crevices, tie directly into your synapses. They take control, absolute control. They read your thoughts, they sense your emotions, what your eyes see, they see. What your tongue tastes, they taste. If your hand moves, it's because they moved it. If you speak, it is the Yerk who has spoken through you, made you into a ventriloquist dummy. Over the course of years, they spread like a virus. Invisible, undetectable, they are your teacher, your pastor, your best friend. They are the police officer, the TV newsman, the soldier, anyone. Jake's parents had recently been taken. They were human controllers, people controlled by Yerks. Jake's brother Tom, my cousin, had been a controller for a long time. He was a powerful Yerk. Jake still cared for him, still hoped somehow he could be saved. Jake had sent me away with Tom. I understood. I approved. If Jake hadn't sent me, I'd have gone anyway. Still, though, I was scared. I had power myself. We all did. The strange, unsettling power to absorb DNA from any living creature to then alter our physical bodies to become that creature. I've been a whole zoo, you know? Everything from a fly to an elephant. Bat, owl, I've flown way up in the sky with eagle wings. I've flown up there with Tobias, way up in the clouds. If there's something better than that, well, I've never found it. It's not magic, just technology. Of course, technology always seems like magic at first. Haul a 10th century night into the modern age and show them your cell phone or your TV or your computer or your car. Magic. This technology came from the Andalites. The Andalites are enemies of the Yerks, and I guess allies of ours, though right at the moment they were more likely to annihilate Earth than the Yerks were. You know the old saying, with friends like these, who needs enemies? Anyway, it began with a chance meeting. An Andalite prince named Elfengor crashed his shot-up fighter in our path. Coincidence? No. History. And a helping hand from the Elamist, who of course never lends a helping hand. Elfangor died, but not before he told us what was happening and gave us the morphing technology. I've been a rat. A dolphin. Ugh, oh, man, do they have fun. That rush when you're zooming straight up through the water, when you see the ripply surface of the sea, when you blow through that barrier and soar through the air. 
and then splash and do it all over again. So, anyway, we decided we had to try and stop the Irks. Jake and Tobias and Cassie and Marco and Axe, who's Elfangor's little brother, and me. We lived this secret life. We fought and mostly lost, but we survived. We frustrated the Irks. We ruined Visser III's life, though he still managed to be promoted to Visser I. Maybe we did too good a job frustrating the Visser. The Yerks grew tired of infiltration. Visser I had been craving open war, and when we blew up their ground-based Yerk pool, the source of their food, the center of their lives, it was gloves off. So much the better as far as I was concerned. The time had come to settle things. The Yerks obliterated our town to create a dead zone around their construction of a new Yerk pool. They were in a hurry. Without a functioning pool, they were getting hungry. But there was a worm gnawing at the Yerk race. They had acquired morphing technology themselves, in part because of what Jake thought was Cassie's betrayal. Cassie sees farther than I do, further than any of us. She sees deep. The girl cannot dress or accessorize to save her life. She's a girl who wears manure-stained Walmart jeans for crying out loud. But Cassie sees connections and possibilities that others don't. She let Tom take the morphing cube, and that changed everything. Some Yerks began to see a way out of their parasitic lives. The hunger-crazed Taxons, a race held captive by the Yerks, began to dream of a life without their Yerk overlords. A revolution was brewing. At the same time, the Andalite fleet was closing in, ready to obliterate Earth as the only way to stop the Yerk infestation. They had watched the Yerks concentrate their forces on Earth. They were ready to bring down the curtain, obliterate Earth, and the Yerk Empire would be gutted. Too bad about those creatures who got in the way. What were they called? Oh yeah, humans. But Tom betrayed his viscer, betrayed the Yerk race. Not for the sake of poor old humanity, but for his own ambition. He would escape with the Morphing Cube and with a hard core of faithful Yerk supporters. He would abandon the Yerk people to the Andalite Vengeance, destroy the hated Animorphs, and if H. Sapiens was annihilated too, well... That's where Jake saw his chance. Tom's Yerk is smart. Jake is smarter. Now Jake and the others had control of the Yerk pool ship. Tom had control of the Visser's own personal blade ship. Tom, the Yerk in Tom's head, was closing in for his final act of betrayal. He would kill his master, Visser One, and doom his fellow Yerks. He thought we were already dead. Surprise, Tom. My favorite morph was the grizzly bear. Seven feet tall, standing erect. You cannot imagine the power, especially when united with human intelligence and knowledge. Compared to my grizzly morph, a human being is like something made out of glued together popsicle sticks. How many times have I felt that change as muscle piles on muscle? As the thick brown fur covers me, as the rail spike claws grow from my fingers? The grizzly bear and I had been through a lot together. I would go grizzly to kill Tom. I was a flea on Tom's head. A flea can't see much, really, just an impression of light or dark. Not my favorite morph. But if you want to hide out, unnoticed, on a human body, you can't beat the flea. And with practice, you can learn to understand speech from the distant, distorted vibrations that reach your quivering antenna. My time was coming, and I had to find a place to demorph and remorph. I fired the spring-loaded legs and catapulted into the air. It took forever for me to fall. The first time you do it, it scares the pee out of you. Falling and falling like that? Like you jumped off the moon and were falling to earth. I hit the deck, a fall of thousands of times my own height. Flea didn't care. Not even a bruise. A strained voice said, That's... that's not a waste dump. They aren't dumping waste. That's the pool. The main pool. It's been flushed. There was an audible gasp from several voices the human controllers and hork bajir controllers who were Tom's bridge crew. Sensors showing, it's our people. 16,000, maybe 17,000? Tom cut in harshly. Saves us the trouble of killing them ourselves. Then, in an undertone, but why? Why would the viscer flush? What does this mean? It means Jake's alive, Tommy boy. You'll figure out in a minute, Yerk. But I'm guessing it will be too late. Away from blood, that's where I had to go. 
The flea's senses were all attuned to the warm scent of blood. But that scent represented danger to me now, and I hopped away, each bounding leap the equivalent of a human jumping over the Grand Canyon. Try getting a flea morph to move away from blood. Amazing how much resistance you can get from a brain that's about ten cells big. I felt shade, absence of light, distance from vibration, no scent of blood. Was I in a safe place? Surely not, but maybe safe enough. I began a slow, cautious demorph. I heard a yell. The pool ship is preparing to fire! Hard left! Tom yelled. A moment later, Tom laughed. The visor's lost maneuvering ability. The pool ship handles like a drunken jet at the best of times, and now look at it. Someone else reported. His draken cannon is powering down. I show his reserves at less than 10%. Are they? Well, well, Tom said. Hail the visor. On screen. I was halfway demorphed. I was a hideous creature made up of armored plates and prickly legs and human flesh spreading across me like a wave. The sickest imagination could not conjure up the true creepiness of a half-flea human. Human eyes, my own eyes, bulged from an insect face. I could see. Not well, confused, distorted, my visual cortex still more flea than human. I was still on the bridge of the blade ship. I was actually crouched beneath an unoccupied control station. It was like hiding under a desk. Fortunately, it was designed for a hork bajir body, so there was some room. I saw the view screen light up. I saw Visser 1's andalite face. It was different. There was a dull look in his usually aggressive eyes, a slackness in the normally tensed body. You seem to be experiencing some engine trouble, Visser, Tom gloated. I was completely demorphed now. There would be no room for me to morph all the way to Grizzly and stay concealed. Every eye on the bridge was watching the screen, but a seven-foot bear looming up would definitely attract attention. I started the morph. If it turned out I wasn't needed, well, then it would be fatally stupid of me. But I had no real doubt. Mr. One said, The Empire will track you down and kill you. You do understand that, I hope. Oh, I doubt it. I think the Empire will have its hands full, Tom said cheerfully. The Andalite fleet is rather close by. It's possible that I misled you on that point. He was all but giggling. Then the view screen widened out and he saw, and I saw, the lithe Bengal tiger standing near the visor. Tobias was there too. Tom saw the tiger and knew it was Jake and knew in that split second that he had been outmaneuvered, outfought. He took a step back like he'd been punched. You're not dead, he cried. I noticed the same thing, Visser One said dryly. Tom yelled, bring us around to target the pool ship's bridge. Do it, now. Now, bring us around! At that moment, I could have morphed all the way to Elephant without being noticed. Tom's panic was infectious. They all knew that they'd been had, but they didn't know how. Tom's reaction was pure instinct. Shoot. He'd forgotten that the pool ship was helpless. The sight of Jake, who should be dead, standing there with the other Animorphs, standing there alive and apparently in control of the pool ship, all Tom could think of was shooting. The danger was closer than that. Jake looked at me, like he knew I was watching him. Rachel, he said. Go. Rachel, Tobias said. I know, Tobias, I know, I said. I was still not completely morphed when someone shrieked, Animorph! After all these years of the Yerks thinking we were Andalites, always yelling Andalite whenever they saw a morph, it was strangely gratifying that at last they knew who we were. I said, that's right, genius. Animorph. I did what I do better than anyone. What Jake counted on me to do. I attacked. I attacked. I charged attacked. straight attacked. for Tom on all fours, attacked. head down, an express train of muscle and fur, claws and teeth. I hit him with my lowered head and knocked him back into the view screen. Not enough to take Tom out, but I had to try and damage the ship. Someone fired a drink at me. I felt the searing pain in my right flank, but it didn't matter. I was in berserk mode. Pain was something that could be stored up for later. Right now, I was an enraged bear. I slammed a shoulder left, slammed a shoulder right, and felt crumpling metal. Tom yelled, No shooting! You'll destroy the bridge! Morph! Morph, you idiots! I swung a paw at him, and it should have been all over right there, but I missed. He dropped, and I missed. I reared up to my full height, and Tom rolled into a ball. He was down under my legs. I swiped his back and laid his spine open, but I didn't stop him. 
He was through my legs and behind me, and staggering towards the exit. I spun, dropped to all fours, and bounded to cut him off. I reached the exit a split second before him and shouldered him aside in the process. He spun like a top and fell on his butt. I was in a clumsy stance, so I just sort of dropped on him. It was like some WWF body slam, only I wasn't faking it. He grunted, and I saw blood gush from his nose and mouth. Too easy. My final battle, it couldn't be this easy. I drew back, ready to go in and finish the job, but I had wasted too much time. There were others on the bridge, and I had overlooked the fact that we were no longer the only ones who could morph. Every member of Tom's hand-picked crew could morph, and I was surrounded now by a half-dozen half-morphed beasts. Tom himself was starting to morph, but he wasn't my main problem now. Rachel, behind! It was Jake. He was watching the fight from the cool ship. I spun and slashed horizontally, and something that may have been a half-morphed leopard crumpled like a Dixie cup. The main weapon station was right there, a sort of waist-high, freestanding lectern. I threw myself back into it and heard a nice crunch as a topper. But that was more seconds lost while the Yerks were completing their morphs. All but Tom. His scarred back was crusting over with reptilian scales, but he was nothing recognizable yet. And in any case, I had plenty to keep me busy. I faced two lionesses, a cape buffalo and a polar bear. It was a whole zoo full of dangerous animals. The polar bear was my equal all by himself. The cape buffalo maybe as well. I could take either lioness, but the combination was going to be rough. For a wondrous, frozen moment, we all waited, stared, breathed, tensed, expectant. I felt... I felt exalted. It was my moment. This was my place and my time and my own perfection. I was no longer afraid. Weird. If I'd had a mouth, I'd have smiled. Well, I said. No one moved. Scared? I asked. No answer. You should be, I said, almost laughing. I lunged straight for the polar bear. Go for the main opponent first. Go for the danger. I barreled straight into him. It was a train crash. I slammed him, my shoulder into the side of his head. He had a bear morph. I was in my bear morph. Experience is very helpful. The polar bear staggered. I extended my claws, and in a move no real bear had ever learned, I drove him straight into him, like four daggers, right beneath the front right shoulder, the heart. I hit him again before the cape buffalo slammed me and knocked me, windless, rolling into the bulkhead. The buffalo backed up and came at me again, the wide, thick horns like a battering ram. But the beast's hooves were designed for dirt and grass, not this slippery floor. He didn't fall, but he lost a lot of speed and momentum. He hit me in my exposed belly. It would have killed me if he'd been up to speed. Even so, it crushed the last ounce of air from my lungs. I felt like someone had dropped a house on me. A lioness was on my face, clawing madly like a crazed alligator. The other one was trying to bite my neck. A waste of time. No one bites through a grizzly spur. I was down, buried in mad fur. I was down, slashed at, punched, hammered, clawed. My legs were in the air, helpless. I drew my legs close and shifted my weight. I got my legs under me. I lifted myself and the two lions. I shook myself violently and threw off the lion who'd been on my face. I aimed a blow at her, but she was too fast. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the polar bear demorph me. It's the only way when your morph body is dying. Demorph and fast. Die and morph, and you're dead. Period. But I was missing something. Something nagged at me. Tom! Jake yelled. Tom! The cape buffalo butted me in the hindquarters and spun me around. The lion on my back was reaching around like it was trying to strangle me, digging busy claws into the folds of loose skin around my throat. The second lion charged gamely, leaped, and sank its teeth into my left haunch. Had to take down the yerk with the polar bear morph. Had to stop him remorphing. I'd been lucky once, experience a but I couldn't count on a second easy win against a polar bear. I tried to stagger forward, but the buffalo had done some damage now. My hindquarters were numb and weak. He was hitting me with short, sharp blows like a boxer or rabbit punching. He had figured out that he couldn't really wind up and deliver a killing blow. Tom! Rachel! Tom! Look out for Tom! Jake's voice was far away. Strange. The slick floor that handicapped the buffalo now worked against me, too. I couldn't get enough traction with my blood-slicked pads. 
had to get the yerk with the polar bear. He was demorphed now, ready to start morphing and come back rejuvenated. He's so heavy. Floor all covered in blood. Wow, we're really bleeding. My front right leg suddenly buckled. It was a pail of ice water in my face, a sudden realization. My blood. That was my blood on the floor. White fur began to ripple across the morphing ear. He's a snake, a voice cried. Rachel! No, he's a bear, I thought. A flash of movement, so fast it was a blur. Something in my eyes, burning. I couldn't see. That's okay, okay? Bears can't see all that well anyway. I had... I had... A cobra, some distant, strange, analytical part of my brain noted. Tom's morph, a cobra. The venom was in my eyes. I couldn't think. I couldn't see. Demorph. No, bear. The lion's on me. Weak. Strange. To be the bear and be weak. Strange. I realized I was no longer standing. I heard my own slow breathing. I should be panting. Something striking at my face again and again. The cobra. Couldn't even see him. I had failed. Tom. Alive. Die, human, he said. Just die. Rachel, Tobias cried. Help me, Tobias, I pleaded. I can't, I... He didn't understand. Help me get him. Help me get him. Okay, okay, he's... Your left paw, towards your face. Get ready. It has to be fast. I'm ready. Now. I jerked my paw, claws extended towards my face. Tom shrieked. I couldn't see him, but I felt something squirming, like a worm on a fish hook. The snake was impaled on my claws. No! Tom cried in outrage. No! I brought my paw to my mouth. Sorry, I said vaguely. Jake, stop her! The yerk screamed with Tom's mouth. I bit down on the snake. I lay there in suspended animation. I felt myself floating. The bear was melting. Old grizzly bear, my friend. Good old bear. I demorphed. The snake was still in my mouth, motionless. I demorphed. I was Rachel again, the human Rachel, alive, unhurt. I could have bounded up and gone off to the mall to shop, but I didn't kid myself. I didn't hope. I spit the snake out. I was surrounded on all sides. I was only a weak human girl now. The polar bear loomed over me, his strength the equal of my own grizzly. But now, I was just me. Just Rachel. I could see the view screen. I could see my best friend Cassie. Jake. Marco. Funny Marco. Axe. Tobias. He had morphed. He was his human self once more. He'd done that for me. And because he was crying, I understood. Humans cry. Hawks don't. I love you, I said to the screen. And oh god, how could so much regret and so much sweetness and so much sadness all be present in that single moment? I was already dead and missing my unlived life. I was already dead and Tobias was mourning. I tried to smile for him. The polar bear said, you fight well, human. Then he killed me with a single blow. Time stopped. He came to me, the elemist. The puppet master come to watch my final act. I figured he was in his saintly old man guise, as fake as everything else about him. The all-powerful weakling, the mighty manipulator. You, I said accusingly. Yes. Who are you? I demanded. Who are you to play games with us? You appear, you disappear, you use us. Who are you? What are you? And then, for what seemed like a very long time, the Elemis told me. I saw. I understood. But I also knew he would not save me. That he couldn't under the arcane rules of his millennia-long war with Krayak. The Elemist was there to honor me. And I guess that was nice of him. Wasn't gonna help me much. I wanted so much to live. I wanted so much to stay and not leave. In a moment, no answer would matter to me. 
but just the same. I wanted to know what I guess any dying person wants to know. Answer this, Elemist. Did I... Did I make a difference? My life and my... My death? Was I worth it? Did my life really matter? Yes, he said. You were brave. You were strong. You were good. You mattered. Yeah. <laughs> okay then. Okay. Ugh. Oh my god. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. Shit. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. <laughs> I didn't think I could recap that justly. Yeah. I don't know. I don't... Uh, it, yeah, I, it needed to be, like, read word for word, I think. <laughs> like, okay. I, I knew what was gonna happen because I spoiled it for myself long before we started this podcast, but still, it did not lessen the impact. Ugh. <sighs> Yeah, I've I've read it I don't know how many times and it it's the impact is never less for me. Uh. And that was like probably the thirtieth time that I've heard that. Really? And I mean it gets to the point where I have some of like the audio clips I can't even like read anymore without hearing it in that voice. But like the very first time that I listened to it in its entirety, I like I had like goosebumps for a lot oh. of it, just hearing it come off the page. Like What is what is that from? Like is it just like a standalone clip that was That is a voice actor that I got to read it for. Are you us. fucking kidding me? Oh my god, that's amazing! I like. <laughs> I, oh my god! I thought that was like an official like voice thing that they released because I was like, okay, I know they haven't no. reached the audiobook part of this, but like, oh my god, are you serious? Literally, while I was supposed to be wedding planning, I was like <laughs> listening to auditions of voice oh actors. My god! <laughs> <laughs> That is so cool. Yeah, she's she's awesome. Oh my god. For sure. I I will credit her when we uh when we do this. I don't have her name in front of me, but yeah, she's super oh, awesome. She was perfect. Yeah. Like I listened to a lot of auditions and um she was the one as soon as she did the first line like the my name is Rachel, I was like, yeah. Yeah. <gasps> that is so awesome. <laughs> That's so cool, Alex! <laughs> oh my god. Oh. I love that so much. <laughs> okay, oh my good. god. I'm glad you like it. Uh, and I thought it would be, especially because we don't want to do the two hour time limit, I'm like, screw the intro. Yeah, Just yeah, yeah. like drop it into I, the feed. Just in. Yeah, oh my god. No, and it like, it gives it so much weight. Like, Oh, like, as far as I'm concerned, like, the book kind of ended for me, like, mentally in that moment. Yeah. So it just, oh, that was, oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I agree. <sighs> I agree. I'm glad it didn't physically end right there. Yeah. But, yeah, mentally, that's, this is the end for me as yeah. well. Oh, my God. And now I have it for all time. You do. So I can cry forever. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. This is like oh. this is one of the few book series that makes me cry. Oh That's for sure. You didn't I was reading this like late last night, like, oh my god. <laughs> oh no. But you didn't cry at Coco. I did not cry at Coco. Just this. Oh my god. 
Oh. And hence your tattoo that you have. Oh my god. So tell me everything about your first experience reading through this. Well, I like, I prepped for this book. Like, I, I put it off for like several hours because I'm like, I don't want to, but also I do, but also I don't. Um, you know, partially because I knew like what was going to happen, at least Rachel. And then I spent like another 30 minutes just typing out all my predictions about how everything was going to shake out. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get close to right? Um, I got sort of in the spirit of things. Like, like everything that ended up happening in the books to the characters kind of like made sense to me and kind of like aligned with like the mental state that I thought they would be in. Um, mm-hmm. but, like, the book took a turn that I did not expect towards the, uh, last <laughs> third of it. Yeah. Like, what the fuck? I was, I will admit, when you started texting me, like, what the fuck, I was like, oh my god, I hope she doesn't hate this book. Because, <laughs> like, I was so worried that you got through the Rachel part, and then you were like, what the fuck is this? Like, this is some bullshit. And I was like, oh my god, we're going to get on the phone. She's going to tell me this didn't affect her at all. She thought it was stupid. No! I got so scared. <laughs> I'm, I, I guess I was just confused more than anything. But then I, like, you know, I read, um, full disclosure, I read the letter from Applegate again. Um, yes, at the end. I have that bookmarked yeah. in my book to read in its entirety at the end. Okay, cool. Yeah, and and it, it made a little more sense to me after I read that. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm looking forward to, like, discussing it further. Yeah. But yeah, the first Oof. time I read that Rachel thing, like, before I knew it, tears were just spilling out of my eyes, and I had to, like, sit down with myself for a couple of minutes before I could go back to reading. I was just like, oh, God! Yeah. For me, it's It's always that, like, this is my moment and the total elation of, like, everybody, their eyes are on me and this is my time to, like, make a stand and do what I was meant to do to that brutal end where, like, when it's over, she's already mourning it before it, like, that emotional roller coaster is too much for me. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. Oh, my God. This is why I shrieked in the middle of the bookstore like my voice went insane when Applegate was like do you forgive me for the ending and I'm like it's tattooed on my butt <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh yeah. no uh, did you had you told her that Rachel was your favorite character yes more than once at this point okay. in my life I have informed <laughs> Applegate that Rachel to, with her responding so I know she's aware I have informed her multiple times that Rachel's <laughs> <laughs> you killed my favorite oh. character <laughs> I don't know I just have so many questions that I need to ask <laughs> that I forget every time I have the opportunity oh no Do you? so every time you read the series and you get to that part do you cry every time I have yeah except for the very first time I read it um, I was in shock like oh yeah, t- I, yeah tell me about the first time So the very, very first time I read it, um, I had not been keeping up with the series consistently. Okay. So I had been kind of reading sporadically, but I hadn't, like, read the last, like, four or five books, like, through. Mm -hmm. And I went into the Borders, and I can, like, I remember the layout of the store and everything, and went back to the section, and I saw this last book, and I saw the, the whole this is the final book. And I remember picking it up and starting to read it. And like, because it was like so early on, I literally was just standing there reading it. And like, I couldn't stop. I was like, oh, wow. what the fuck? Literally, what the fuck? And like, I remember I got to the part where she died. And it was like, you know how people always talk about that feeling of like the floor drops out from underneath you? Uh-huh. I was literally like, that happened and I was like, oh my god, like somebody I love just died. And like I'm standing in a borders and like in the kids section, I'm like, you know, it's chaotic. There's people oh, everywhere no! like screaming shit. And I remember just being like, I am in a, an experience that none of these people will understand right now. Oh. Like they do not know the gravity of the situation Holy that just happened. Shit. 
And like, it was just, it was so intense. And like, I bought the book, I took it home, but the whole, I read that whole first thing standing there in front of the shelf, like just stunned oh my God. absolutely stunned i did not see it coming because i hadn't read the previous book uh-huh. so i did not see it coming it like it hit me out of nowhere oh, wow. and i was like oh shit oh. yeah and I, t- I took it home and reread the whole thing started right over <laughs> so like your second like full read through or like rather your first full read through of all the books like did it hit you a lot differently like knowing and like seeing everything all of the indicators it it was more like oh i see how like i could have seen this coming mm-hmm. had i read the full series but her death never hits me differently it's okay such a strong standalone scene on its own to me that like it never hits differently it's always just as heartbreaking every single time yeah i mean at least now i know it's coming and can kind of prepare myself that first time was like shock yeah oh my god (laughs) well and so i think it was like last episode we were talking about specifically with james and the auxiliary animorphs um like how they portrayed death in that moment as just like you don't necessarily get that moment to say goodbye and to say like you did good or you know Mm -hmm. and i was kind of worried that rachel's death was going to be like she kills Tom and then like the ship blows up and she's never going to get that moment. But the fact that she got to say, I love you to Tobias one last time and, and, and have that, that closure with the Alamist was like, I'm really glad that that happened for her. Me too. I'm glad that that moment happened. And then the immediate next, I wondered if, yeah, and then it's just cut off and nothing. Yeah. It's like, it's kind of both wazing it a little bit. It's like yeah. we get the closure, but then we always have that hanging yeah. thought. Oh my God. Oh, it's so perfect. It is. It is so perfect. <laughs> I don't like it, but yeah. Fuck. And I mean, this is only the first four chapters. This is page 25 right. or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> this is nothing but a small portion of this book yeah <laughs> I, I don't know what else to say about this just, I don't I don't either sadly drinks beer <laughs> <laughs> I don't know I mean it feels like we should take more time I guess because emotionally I need more time <laughs> and yet we still have so much more to talk about oh my god <laughs> I guess we just move on. No. <laughs> I don't want to, but I don't know. I feel like there's like there's a lot of arguments that could be talked about, like people saying, of course, it always had to be Rachel and like, oh, yeah, she had to die because she wouldn't have recovered after the war. But it's all right there in the ending. She wanted to live. It could have been any of them. It didn't have to be Rachel. It's all right there. Like, what more can we say? Yeah. I'm like, I'm not. I'm not mad that she, I mean, like, not to sound terrible, but it's like, I'm not necessarily mad that she died. And I think from a narrative standpoint, it, like, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what to say without sounding awful. (laughs) No, just say it. You don't sound awful. Like, I, I mean, you had alluded to in past books, like, this is going to manifest itself at the very end and this is gonna like tie it together beautifully and then it just like it did like it it just makes sense and it you know not that you know i don't think that she couldn't have recovered after the war like but like really that last her last book the david book just like you're right it like it it works so well with this because like she in that moment confronted the darkest part of herself and she you know decided that she wanted to be good and she did not want to murder people and but she also accepted that she was the one who could do the hard thing that needed to be done and 
that was perfectly echoed in this scene. Like, so intense. Yeah. They set the stage so well for the yeah. for this moment. Yeah, that was like the perfect last book for her to end on. That's as I think as close to perfect of an ending as any has been written for any character. This is just yeah, Rachel. That's how it ends for her. Like, ugh. not that I'm not heartbroken, and not that I wasn't mad when it first happened, and not that I wouldn't you know want her back or you know. I wanted her to live as much as she wanted to live, probably. Well, she probably wanted to live more, but <laughs> I wanted her to live. But, you know, when it happened, it it was just, it was perfect. Yep. Well, should we deal with the fallout of the rest of it? <laughs> I guess so. This is our burden as those that lived through this to confront what we are left behind with. I mean, there's a lot left to cover, too, so... So much. So much. That's why there's no time limit on this episode because who gives a shit if we live or die or become nothlets? No one cares. Yep. <laughs> and my chapters are, it's very long. <laughs> it's very long. There was no easy way to sum up these chapters. We probably should have just sat down and read this entire book, but I didn't. I only did that for the first four chapters. <laughs> You ready to get into it? I guess so. Okay. So we cut to Jake's perspective, and everybody froze. Nobody breathed until Toby burst into the room, bloody from the battle on the ship. And she said, Jake, they're surrendering. They want amnesty and a chance to acquire the morphing powers. Jake heard Toby, but he was still frozen. Toby looked around curiously, spotting Tobias as a human, and asked, what happened? Jake watched the blade ship pull away and pick up speed. Tom was dead, Rachel was dead, over 17,000 Yerks were dead, all at his command. And how many more? Doubleday's soldiers, the auxiliary animorphs, the free hork bajur. Toby pressed him, saying, Jake. His only thought was how he would explain ordering his cousin to kill his brother to his parents, which was such a stupid thought in that moment. Cassie tried to buffer, telling Toby that Rachel had died, and Toby squared up before informing them that her father, Jarrah Hami, had also lost his life that day. Marco was the first one to snap out of it, telling Toby to inform the Yerks that Jake would be along shortly and he would accept their terms. <laughs> I'm sorry, I realized my headphones were in backwards. And I was like, why That's can't okay. I? Hear I was just watching you switch them. <laughs> like, it's I was okay. like this whole time I was like I can I can't hear that well like what's going on this this feels wrong and like why is the volume on this side of the everything is fucked up yes <laughs> I'm sorry for interrupting do not be um, so Marco's the first one to snap out of it telling Toby to inform the Yerks that Jake would be along shortly and we they would accept their terms Axe informed Marco that his people may not agree, and Marco said, well, you know what? This is our planet, our victory, our prisoners. They can come fight us, too, if they want. Cassie is the first one to come up to Jake and lean against him, the closest they could get to a hug at that moment, and Jake feared so much that Cassie would comfort him. He knew that if she did, he would break and it would become real, but instead she just said, come on, there's more to do. Everything else can wait, and that was what Jake needed in that moment. And with a deep sigh, he continued on, refusing to look at Tobias. He couldn't. He told Cassie to go inform Eric that he needs to make himself scarce. And when Cassie asks if that's all I should tell them, Jake says, What, do you think I'm going to apologize? His little act of draining the cannons meant that Rachel died needlessly. Visor One then chimed in that he guessed it was time for them to execute him. And Jake said, No, no more killing. Everybody seemed stunned at this. Jake started to demorph before stopping himself and privately talking to Axe, who, a moment later, smacked Visor One up the side of the head with a tail blade, knocking him out. <laughs> Jake ordered Visor One's Yerk to vacate his body within two minutes or they would take him out the hard way. Jake told Marco and Axe to get a box and secure him as a prisoner, and then followed Toby out to the ship. He asked for a spokesperson, and Subvisor 74 stepped up. A battered female hork stepped into view in front of him and reiterated their demands. Jake pointed out that they had the ship, they have Visor 1, the Yerks aren't really in a position to make demands. But Subvisor 74 said, if you, you know, you can't scare us, we have nothing left to lose. Like, we can demand whatever the fuck we want because we'll just resume fighting right here and right now. And we might die, but we'll take a bunch of you with us. 
Jake says, fair enough. You want amnesty, access to Kendrona rays, and the morphing technology. In return, you would permanently morph and relocate. Subvisor74 said, as opposed to a slow death and starvation, yeah, we'll take it, dude. Jake told him that he didn't have the morphing cube, but he would use everything in his power to negotiate those terms. Subvisor74 stood at attention silently for a few beats before slumping down and asking, it's come to this after all? Jake simply said, yeah, and then ordered her to go refill the onboard yerk pool. Once this was complete, the yerks were to abandon their host bodies. The yerk bitterly spit out and be helpless again, but Jake reiterated, I keep my word. He turned to leave, but before he did, he stopped and he said, Toby, I'm sorry about Jarahami. He was... And where Jake trailed off, Toby picked up. He was the first of the free hork -Bajur. He was the father of his people, and he was my father. And that's the first Jake chapter after Rachel dies. Yeah. <laughs> These are just brutal fucking chapters. Mm -hmm. I have nothing to say. I have nothing to add. Oh my god. Um, we don't even take the time to really honor Jerahami past this moment. Yeah. It's just sad. That's super sad. I mean, he's right though. Double Days people, the auxiliary animorphs, like there's so many people we can't mourn them all. And I was kind of sad that that there were more kind of un unfinished things like that. There was a lot of unfinished shit. It felt like yeah. It was like, I feel like humor is going to be very scarce in this episode. <laughs> Until the end, it picks up at the That's end. That's true. We'll get there. Yep. We'll get there. Just know that we're mourning the loss of a loved one right now. We cut to Cassie, who was stunned. She couldn't believe that Rachel, her best friend, Rachel, was gone. Her best friend who teased her about her clothes, that she teased about her obsessive shopping. Her friend who wanted to be a gymnast but always thought she was too tall to be any good. Her friend who walked through the world seemingly unaffected by it. She could walk through a car wash and come out dry, move through a mosh pit and never be jostled, wear a white dress and dig in the mud, but emerge without a spot on her. <laughs> Megan Fox pants! <laughs> Megan Fox pants. <laughs> but the war had touched her and changed her. She alone had liked it, loved it even. She had enjoyed the fight. Cassie had imagined her as a Viking or a knight, a joyful warrior, and she had died fighting impossible odds. Cassie felt like somebody had torn a hole in her chest, and now they were left, the victim perpetrators. Cassie found Eric simply by walking through the ship and calling out for him, a lone wolf wandering the hallways. Eric had appeared suddenly in front of her and smiled sadly at her, saying, Jake sent you? Cassie confirmed this, and Eric said, I see. He feels guilty. And Cassie said no. Eric immediately appeared annoyed and said, he used me, he blackmailed me, he forced me to break through security, the security system to take over the ship with blackmail, all that shit. And Cassie goes, yes, and then you drained the Draken beams of power. Eric immediately railed against her, saying, what did you expect me? Enable him to kill all the people on the, the blade ship? What the fuck did you want me to do? And Cassie tells him, the blade ship got away. Because of you, Rachel and Tom are both, well, the blade ship got away. Eric drops the hologram now. He was his own ivory and steel dog self. And he goes, what? And I'm supposed to feel bad that Jake ordered his cousin to kill his brother and I didn't allow him to massacre everyone else on the blade ship? Eric took one look at Cassie and saw her anger at this and dismissed her. He just said, so you too, huh, Cassie? Cassie jumped in to defend Jake, saying he did what he had to. Eric said, oh, did he have to flush the Eric pool, killing over 17,000 sentient creatures? Cassie started to say they needed a diversion, but then stopped herself. And Eric goes, a diversion? That's what you needed? So you massacred them. Instead of answering him, Cassie said, the Andalites are going to be coming aboard soon, so if you want to keep the Chi a secret, you should vacate. They both move to go their separate ways, but before they do, Eric grabs Cassie's arm and says, take care of Jake. He's going to need you. <sighs> Trolley problem! Fucking Chi. Fuck Eric. Yeah. I hate Eric. Fucking no bedside manner there. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I hate Eric. I feel like so many things. <laughs> I, I liked Eric at the beginning and now, wow. Not even one shred of fucking, I don't know. I don't even know. I don't know. I just, I thought they were, I thought they'd have more fucking 
empathy and emotion. But he was just so fucking bitter that Jake used him that he just refused to admit he was wrong in any way. And that fucking sucks. And it especially sucks because as soon as this war was like, there was a clear cut line for Jake of this is over. He would not kill anymore. He wouldn't kill Vizzer 1, which like their main goal, one of their main goals had been get rid of Vizzer 1. And he wouldn't do it once the war was over. And the fact that Eric didn't even put enough stock in Jake to say like he knows where to draw the line Instead, he just doubles down with this whole, like, what, let him massacre everybody on the blade ship? It's like, no, dude. He would have asked for their surrender. If they didn't surrender, then he would have escalated, but they had the option. He wouldn't have done that. You just assumed. And because of you, they weren't able to save Rachel, and they weren't able to, you know, save Tom in that moment. Yeah. Eric's shitty. Also, the whole take care of Jake, he's going to need you. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, she knows, dude. Why do you get to say that? What the fuck is your problem? <laughs> uh, I kind of feel like anyone else, if it, had, if it hadn't been Cassie, anyone else would have, like, fucked his shit up. Ugh. It would have been very difficult since he is an ancient, indestructible robot, but they would have yeah. fucked his shit up. Yeah, at least attempted to fuck his shit up. I was kind of hoping Cassie would would swing at him, honestly. Yeah. This is the moment where Cassie breaks. Yeah. Oh, my God. Speaking of the moment where Cassie breaks, this is, like, for me, finally, Cassie is mourning her friend. Like, finally, it's Cassie and her thoughts about Rachel and their friendship. And it, like, it was so (laughs) one-sided. Why did it take this, Cassie? Why? (laughs) <laughs> yeah i don't it's it's really it's really interesting just seeing her progress through this whole war like i don't know like she really just put everything all of her emotional energy into jake and i mean it was kind of that way from the beginning like you know we were saying from the beginning of the book series that she really we didn't always feel the the friendship um and she never really warmed to the other team members beyond like a professional sort of mentality but yeah, but like it's true i felt like i felt like her her sadness about rachel rang a little bit hollow for me yeah i mean i could read it as still in shock that mm-hmm. it even happened at this point yeah um because there's definitely later moments where it feels more true for me mm-hmm. Yeah, and I guess at this point, I can't argue that putting all of her emotional effort into Jake was wrong because, you know, he needed the support as the leader and as the person that had to make all the big decisions. Mm -hmm. Also, I don't know if this means anything, but, like, Cassie stopped Jake from killing Tom. Yeah. Did not stop Rachel from killing David. And in the end, Rachel had to kill Tom. Like, what does that mean? (laughs) I don't know if it means anything, but, like, it's just kind of ironic. God, it feels like just once again, like, Cassie going, I couldn't have let Jake kill his brother. That would have destroyed him. But Rachel will take out the emotional trash that we all have stockpiled back here. Yeah. Like, once again, let her do the fucking uh, exactly. job. Exactly, that's... I mean, not that we can blame Cassie for the whole Tom thing, because they specifically hit it from Cassie and Tobias, knowing that they would fuck it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... Yeah. Yeah, it definitely feels like... It's ironic, kind of. It is ironic. But I was really glad that in the, like, moment where Cassie and Eric are arguing, where in 99% of other scenarios... Like, this is what rang true for me with the whole Rachel and Cassie thing. 99% of other scenarios, Cassie would be like, it is absolutely wrong to kill 17,000 sentient creatures. But the fact that her best friend died does overshadow that in this moment. Yeah. So yeah. that at least rang true for me. And I really... That's that's a good point. I appreciated that at least. Yeah. And like, especially over the last few books, we've seen Cassie kind of like get to a point where she is obviously confronted with a moral issue. And mm-hmm. Even though it bothers her, she decides to just be like, you know what? Fuck it. We're in it so deep that it's just like, whatever happens, happens. 
And that feels pretty believable to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, she can't... Yeah, for sure. She can't afford to keep, like, pumping the brakes on things because it's wrong. Because everything is wrong. So you just have to do Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Ugh. I was really kind of expecting her to, like, do something with Eric, though. Just throw him out of the ship. Yeah, just, like, flush him out the airlock or some shit. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Fucking goodbye, Eric. Or call him a piece of shit or something. (laughs) Just whatever it took. Kick him a little. Yeah. Even if it didn't hurt him, it would make me feel better. (laughs) Do it for us, Cassie. (laughs) Yeah, do it for us. It's not for you, it's for us. (laughs) Wow, this next chapter's long. Yeah. You ready for this? I guess. (laughs) I considered reading directly from the book, but I think I tried to sum it up pretty well, so hopefully you'll forgive me for butchering Jake's excellent, excellent speech in this next chapter. Mm -hmm. So we cut to Marco's perspective, and Marco and Axe are watching as the Yerk exited its host body that it had inhabited for years. They had found a briefcase with a key lock to store him in. It was stashed under one of the workstations, and it was filled with cookies when they found it. <laughs> cookie case! So, <laughs> yeah. Like, some controller just was like, I fucking love cookies. We're going to space. Here's my briefcase full of cookies. I fucking love that. <laughs> this was great. This was, like, the first one of those moments where you're like, what the, like, why are you telling me jokes now in the middle of this <laughs> terrible, could, terrible thing? How could you? How could you do this to me? <laughs> Yeah, so Marco's, like, literally munching away on a cookie while they're watching Visor 1 crawl out of Aloran's body. And Marco mentions, like, I'm the least emotional one of all of them. I've always had the ability to see the bright, clear line from A to Z, and all of Jake's choices I understood. And he mentions that morality is kind of the last thing he throws into the equation. Like, he figures out everything mathematically and then throws in the morality at the end. Yeah. Um, And that's, you know... That's just the way he works. <laughs> uh, and then he says that this whole thing was way easier for him, though, because he hadn't been in love with Rachel. She wasn't his one connection with humanity like Tobias. And he also didn't disagree with flushing the Yerk pool. And, you know, maybe Tobias will come around eventually and maybe not. Like, he just seems to not really care in this moment. Yeah, that it's was weird. interesting. Like, he was taking it really well. I don't know. He was. Like, it felt like Marco was the character who is like, one of us is definitely going to die. Like, the others are all like, we're kids, we're invincible, we'll live through us. And Marco was always the one that was like, definitely one or most of us are going to die for sure. Yeah, like, like he's been sitting with that since the beginning and, you know, slowly warming. Not warming to the idea, but just like, you know. (laughs) Accepting it. Coming to terms with the idea. Yeah, exactly. And so when it finally does yeah. happen, he's he's more prepared than the others, I guess. Yeah, he was like, yeah, we've been waiting for this since day one, so... Yeah, and he's probably suspected for a while that it was going to be Rachel. <laughs> God, she feels like the easy choice for this, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. Marco's thoughts are interrupted by musing that it's very odd to literally have the enemy place themselves in your hands as he watches Axe pick up Visor 1 between two fingers like he's holding something dirty. I was really hoping Axe was just gonna, like, pick him up and then just, like, football spike him into the suitcase. (laughs) Or just, like, crush him. Like, fuck it. Like... Oh my god, imagine this moment from Axe's perspective. Like, ah yes, our most hated enemy, the only Yerk to have an Andalite host body for years. Like, the highest ranking Yerk under the Council of Thirteen. And like, he was like, well, Jake told me to put him in the suitcase, so I will. It's like, dude, crush him. Just crush him in your fist. <laughs> he was so, I know your hands are weak. He was so professional about it. I really was expecting him at least to just like bodily throw him into the suitcase. Just for... Uh, he's so professional. And yet he didn't. He's a, he's a consummate professional for sure. Axe is the most professional out of all of us. Yes, I love him. Yeah, me too. So Axe drops Visor One in the briefcase, and Marco goes like, "Huh? I guess we won, Axe." And Axe is like, "Yep." <laughs> cool. And there's like. <laughs> It was like this moment of like, yeah, this is victory. Yay. 
And Marco's like, shouldn't someone be singing God Bless America or something? And Axe just kind of looks at him like, what the fuck? And then he's like, uh, it's not worth it. So, whatever. Axe then kind of is like, well, guess I better go call the Andalites. <laughs> So he hails the Andalite homeworld, and they get an officer on that looks very suspiciously at them. And he's like, what do you want, yurks? And they're like, we're not yurks. Like, what the fuck? We're the Earth Liberation Army, which is Marco's name that he came up with on the fly. He's like, haha, there's six of us, the Earth Liberation Army. Cool. Um, and they're like, we've taken control of this pool ship. And of course, the Andalites are like, no, you haven't. This is a trick. We're not dumb. And Axe starts giving coordinates of, like, well, we, the blade ship is headed, like, that way. You can intercept it. Like, we're telling you shit. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, and that's about the moment where Jake walks in. And he's like, where are we with everything? So they catch him up, and they're like, okay, what do we do? And it's Aloran that answers this question. He's coming out of his stupor from being knocked out, and he goes, give him the pool ship as he, like, climbs unsteadily to his feet. And the Andalite on the view screen is like, ah, yes, there's Vizzer one now, right on time. You thought we were stupid, and yet here he is. <laughs> and Aloran asks for Jake's permission to speak. And Jake's like, he's asking my permission? That's fucking weird. But then he's like, yeah, go for it. And um, Jake calls him War Prince Aloran in that moment, which gets a flicker of emotion before Aloran turns to the Andalites on screen. They, uh, he asks for the Andalite's name, and we find out that they're talking to Offern Jabril Castant of the dome ship Elfangor. More like Offerman. And Axe swells with pride. Offerman. Offerman. Nick Offerman. Yes. <laughs> the Andalite. He's not that angry, though. He's too, I don't know, polite. <laughs> Get the fuck off my view screen. <laughs> Swivels away. <laughs> um, yes. Axe swells with pride at finding out that there's a dome ship named after his brother yeah. because that's, like, the highest form of cool yeah. an Andalite can be. I'm so proud. We're all so proud of him. My heart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Aloran says, that is a well-named ship, and then informs them, what we're going to do is we're going to fly the pool ship out to a point that you choose. We're going to flank it with the bug fighters, and upon arriving at that point, all of the bug fighters will self-destruct. We will then power down and jettison all weapons and wait for the Andalite to board. The screen flips in the blink of an eye to an old scarred Andalite who is missing a stock eye and has gross scars on his head. Axe informs them privately that this is Captain Prince Asculin Semitor Langor. And Marco is like, is this the big time? And Axe is like, this is the big time. So the Captain Prince starts by addressing Aloran as Visor One, and Marco can see he's about to say something that he cannot walk back. So Marco immediately jumps in and says, Hey, Axe Man, is it true that the whole Andalite homeworld is watching this? Can I wave to them? And he starts making an idiot of himself, like, Hey, Mom, hey, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Marco. Um, both Jake and Aloran are horrified before they realize what Marco has already figured out. And that's that they had trapped Asculin and that the whole homeworld can see them. And Asculin does not know that. So he's about to say some fucked up shit. This is when Jake launches into his speech. And it's a really good speech. This is well worth a read. And Marco does a brief decoding for us at the end of every sentence. It's so good. So Jake, it's so good. So Jake starts out with this really, like, flowery message of, like, we know the Andalites were committed to the defeat of the Yurk threat, and they are personally committed to this war. And Marco goes, basically, we knew you were going to burn Earth to a crisp. And Jake goes, because of your commitment, it must almost seem a disappointment to reach your goal, only to discover that your foe has essentially surrendered. Marco adds, it's over. At this point, we must set aside the necessary ruthlessness of war and turn instead to the more satisfying duties of making peace. Marco tells us, your people are watching you, and if you come in guns blazing, they will riot. Jake continues, our victory could never have occurred without the support of our Andalite friends. Marco decodes, we're willing to share credit, even though you did jack shit. Jake starts, I look forward to our two peoples working together, forming a deep and abiding friendship. We have so much to learn from our Andalite brothers, as we have learned so much from Alfangor and his no less resourceful or courageous brother, Aximili. Marco concludes, the dome ship named after Alfanger is going to come in and annihilate us, including his younger brother who is a ready-made war hero, you fucking old fart. <laughs> <laughs> they actually call him an old fart. It's great. 
Uh. Um, the Captain Prince listened, enraged, but could do nothing because they straight up had him. And finally he's like, they're like, who exactly are you? And Marco goes, this is Jake, Jake Berenson, president of Earth. <laughs> president of the entire world. <laughs> yes. Uh. It was great. It was fucking great. Uh. If only the the threat of being exposed on tape to the general public and that weighing in on certain actions being taken would extend to real life circumstances. <laughs> Fucking cops. <laughs> anyway. Uh, we can edit that out. Yeah. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> no, it definitely feels like that for sure. Yeah, there were a lot of parallels in this book and I was like, hmm... It's a little close to home. <laughs> Those motherfuckers knew. They knew. Uh, so we cut back to Jake's perspective. He flies out to the rendezvous point. They all wait for hours. And then suddenly the space around them was surrounded with Andalite fighters, followed by two dome ships. And it was a terrifying moment that they were all surrounding this one ship with all of their weapons triggered, ready to blow it up when they were defenseless, basically. Um, sometime after that, Asculin himself showed up in his own transport ship, and the Andalites board, and they... <laughs> so, Jake sends Axe down to get them, and Jake's like, I don't agree, I wanted to meet them there, but Marco insisted that the boss never goes to the airport, they always send the limo to pick up the guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Marco's like coaching oh. Jake through this whole thing, and I love it. Yeah, Marco was definitely, he's like, here's how we have to play this, Jake. <laughs> yeah, like, don't, don't surrender don't appear weak yeah and there's some point like later in this book where marco mentions like i've always been the planner or whatever the guy like for strategy and it is so true in this moment that like mm -hmm. marco saw how to set up earth in the best position and like made sure it happened even though jake's was the puppet basically yeah <laughs> the grima worm tongue to say it in Oh, God, no. He's <laughs> whispering in his no! ear. <laughs> Except not terrible. Except not terrible. Yes. Although, was no, Grima was trying to destroy Rohan and give it to Mordor, not try to set up Rohan for... Right, yeah, but yeah. the whole puppet thing. The puppet thing, yeah. Sorry, I just had to think it through because for a second I was like, wait a minute, was Grima trying to like take over Rohan? Then I'm like, no, 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 he was a... He was a... a Minion of so Sauron. This is not what we're talking about. <laughs> we're definitely talking about. We always have to bring in a Lord <laughs> of the Rings comparison. That's true. You know what? If Applegate can bring in both Lord of the Rings and Star Trek, then so can we. Also, very Lord of the Rings moment at the end of this book in the final chapter. We will get there. <laughs> ah! Sorry. Back to what we were doing. It's important. The Andalites burst onto the bridge. They're all playing their their parts where the guards are sweeping people and like, you know, they're all like, ah, we're here to fight for the Andalites. But then it turns out that they brought a bunch of nerds who keep walking around <laughs> touching all the screens and shit. Like, ooh. The interns. <laughs> the intern nerds. Um, yeah, so they were all like giddy that they're on a York ship. So Jake sees all this happening and after a minute, he tries to take control of the situation. He goes... All right, once we've settled all the details, we'll be happy to turn the ship over. And Askelin's like, details? What do you mean details? And Jake goes, well, we have a deal with the Yerks and the Taxon to make them morph capable Nothlets, and uh, we're going to go ahead and do that. And Askelin's like, denied. And Jake is shocked. He's like, uh, no, 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 you cannot just flatly deny my request. Like, And he starts again, like, I, you know, I explain like this is the deal i made with him and this is how it's gonna go because this is how we secured peace and asking goes nope you did not have the power to promise what you do not own and you cannot do it so nope denied and jake kind of sees it all now he's like this is their weapon they don't want to share it they're guarding it and jake attempts once again to say like this is the way to peace how can you not see this like you need to understand this is how we end the yurks rely on host bodies and if we grant them bodies of their own they don't need host bodies they have no reason to invade us anymore it just makes sense and Asculin just flatly denies him and jake wavers he's like you know what fuck it what do i care the war's over if the taxon get rounded up and killed the horkbizer it's not my problem anymore i did my bit like i'm fucking done 
And this is when Marco steps up and whispers in Jake's ear, like, if we appear weak now, we will be weak forever. This is your first contact mission, and this is extremely important. If you do not do this right, we will forever be treated as second-class citizens on our own planet. So Jake, like, realizes Marco's right, and he looks around at everybody for help, and, like, Tobias is just checked the fuck out. Cassie is supportive, but she has no clue what to do, and he says Axe has done what he could do, but, you know, after all, he's an Andalite. And then a second later, Axe steps up and he goes, I issue a challenge to you, Ascalant. And uh, all of the Andalites are like, what the fuck? Blah, 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 blah. And all of the, <laughs> yeah, and all the humans are like, what the fuck? What does that mean? I don't, what is a challenge? Why is this such a big deal? And Asculin is like, um, you're an Aris. You cannot challenge me. And then it's a Lauren that steps forward and says, well, Axe can challenge you with the support of a prince. And last time I checked, I was still a prince. And Asculin's like, uh, no, you definitely destroyed the Horkbuzer homeworld with like a quantum virus. And I don't think you should have the power to do this. And a Lauren's like, you were literally on your way to Earth to, like, destroy all the humans, which is basically just what I did. And Asculin's like, yeah, but mine was under orders. And Aloran's like, that's fucking bullshit. Everything you just said was fucking bullshit. Um, <laughs> so Aloran is allowed to back Axe, and they're all freaking out. The humans still don't really know what's going on. And Asculin goes, I have to go consult with my people. And they wait. Nobody moves. And Jake realizes, like, oh, Asculin's waiting for us to vacate the bridge. And Jake's like, it probably wasn't the time to antagonize him, but, like, he big-dogged him. He's like, actually, we won the ship in my victory, so you can go the fuck back to your ship and talk about your shit over there. Damn! Go Jake! <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, but once he leaves, like, everybody's like, okay, what the fuck does this whole challenge thing mean? Like, break it down for us humans because we have no fucking idea what's going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it turns out this is like a very insane thing that Axe has done because basically the Andalites uh, can challenge a superior officer's command at any moment in time if they believe that it is incorrect or wrong or is made from a position of personal gain and not the betterment of the Andalite species. But if the lower officer is found wrong, they get their tail blade cut off and they are banished. If the superior officer was out of line and denies the request or makes like an emergency admission to the council when it wasn't an emergency, then they get banished and stripped of everything and sent away. So like basically whichever side is wrong is going to be fucked unless they go through this challenge and it like gets revoked by one of them and they agree to work it out peaceably. But if they involve the council, one of them is definitely getting their tail blade chopped off and banished for sure. But can't they just morph? I don't understand though. Like, I guess maybe they could, but like, would that be too shameful or like, yeah, I'm have they found a way to do it that it doesn't grow back? Like, Or is it more like a symbol? of disgrace than anything like at the end of Mary Poppins when he gets fired and they like punch his hat and flip his umbrella and shame him. Basically. Yeah. That's kind of what I was thinking more than anything else. Like, yeah, this was something that was in place before the morphing technology became like a popularized thing. Yeah. And clearly Asculin doesn't have the morphing technology with his missing stock eye and scars and everything. Yeah. That's the other thing. I was like, you okay, bud? <laughs> You could fix that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I like it like that. It yeah. makes me look tough. I like it. It's cool. <laughs> I get more females this way. <sighs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, but we got to talk about this next bit because this is oh, honestly one of the... I love this next yeah. chapter. It's so good. Me too. This is all the same chapter. Yes. This all happened in one fucking chapter. This is insane. Yeah. Okay, so um, Asculin goes off to talk with his people to determine whether or not they're going to pursue this trial, which th could take a half a day in the Andalite courts and blah, 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 and the whole disgrace thing. Um, and basically, Aloran's like, they're like, Aloran, what's going to happen? He's like, I have not been with my people for a hot fucking minute, so I don't <laughs> truly know, but... <laughs> He's like, if they think they can win it, they'll come back and, and continue with the challenge. If they think they're going to lose, they'll give in. 
And Jake's like, okay, great. And then he thanks him for backing Axe and us. And Lauren makes this very short clip speech that's very controlled. He's like, I will always be a Lauren butcher of the Horkbisher, but in my years, I hope I've gained some wisdom, the years of being captive. And whether I'm despised or disgraced or whatever, for whatever it's worth, I am yours to command. And he finishes this speech and is silent for a minute. And then in a second, he whips his tail blade over his head and cracks it like a whip and goes to Jake and says, do you know who did that? I did. I did it. And (laughs) this shakes Axe out of his thoughts and Axe touches his tail blade to Aloran and says, welcome back. Oh, I love it so much. Oh my God. This was amazing. Aloran redemption arc. I love it so much. And like the joy of Aloran, like, I did that after all this time. That was me. Like, oh. yeah, it's so infectious. It is so infectious. It's a, it's amazing. Well, uh, after a while, a low ranking and of Asculins comes back and says, okay, it's, you'll get four morph cubes and we'll release them to Aximili, who has been promoted to the rank of Prince and he will be the earth liaison and decide how the cubes are used. Yay! Uh, it's awesome. The officer then waits until Axe responds and Axe says, thank the captain for me. My challenge is formally withdrawn. And with that, the war is officially over. I love Axe. Good job, buddy. Yeah. Axe ended this war. Let it be known. He did. Like, not to discredit everyone else, but he like, he like sealed the fucking thing. He stamped the final thing. Like, oh my God. I'm so proud of him. Yeah. Like yes. He used his, his cunning Andalite politics skill. And this was like, oh my god, the first however many books where it's like, is is it an us or them thing with Axe? And then mm-hmm. Axe is one of us, and then, then Axe betrays Jake, and then Axe talks to the Ant. Like, yeah. it's a whole back and forth thing, but when it came down to the final hour, Axe threw in his lot with humans mm-hmm. and saved earth yay i love him so much (laughs) my favorite boy and now the fallout kind of well we get the aftermath the epilogue sort of for a while (laughs) kind of (laughs) it's weird it's not like an epilogue it's literally like and now we're gonna talk about what happens when a war ends and why everything is still shit. Yeah. Like, I was actually really shocked at the fact that we're only one third of the way through this book. And I was like, what the hell is the rest of the two thirds? Like, I expected the halfway (laughs) point to be when the war ended. And then like a few chapters of like, this is what happened. The end. But it doesn't go that way. Not really. It does not go that way. (laughs) Ugh. So Cassie is watching as the Andalite ship descends with the pool ship into Earth or- Earth's orbit. The Yerks on board finally finalize their terms of surrender, and they offer the remaining Yerks on Earth the choice to surrender and be given the chance to transform or to die. Uh, most of them surrendered. Some of them contacted the Council of Thirteen and were like, we're going to fight. But then like, they have the pool ship, so they have every access code and tactic, and they basically just shut down all the Yerk ships and we're like, good fucking luck. Bye. So that's great. <laughs> Bye. Um, Jake has one more major run-in with Asculin, and that's over who is taking the prisoner, Visor 1. And Jake won that argument as well. And so Visor 1 stayed in Anamorph and Earth custody. The ship that they are on, which is now Prince Aximili's new transport ship, which is something he gets as a prince. Yay! <laughs> They descend into the Washington Mall, and Cassie assures us they did warn them ahead of time that they were doing this. This is not like they just drove a ship into the mall. God. (laughs) Uh. Which would be great, and I support it. (laughs) (laughs) So they all get off of this ship, and Jake and Axe are fielding questions. And to a lesser extent, Marco and Cassie are also like kind of telling stories, because they just descend into this mass of reporters and military people like all these people are waiting for them to hear what's going on and jake and axe are really like the the spearheads of this but um marco's also in the crowd schmoozing and giving another amusing anecdote 
when Tobias, who has acknowledged no one, answered no questions, and refused to talk to anybody since basically the moment Rachel died, he just takes off and leaves and is gone. Nobody hears from him. Forever. A few days later, <laughs> yeah, he just he leaves. A few days later, they get word that the Andalite ships that were in orbit had found a body floating with some of the debris from the ship, and it was a young girl who was blonde. Oh. And they realize that this is probably Rachel, and the blade ship had jettisoned her body before taking off. The Andalites bring her body back to Earth and had shown a great respect, wrapping her in a soft cloth. And Cassie and Naomi went together to identify her. It was. They cremated her knowing that there was no way she'd want to be buried. And a few days later, they held a memorial service. It had to be held outside because of the sheer number of people that wanted to come to it. Uh, Everybody across the whole world knew who they were and what they had done for the earth. And Cassie recognized some of the people there, like Doubleday and, you know, people they had worked with in the war. But there was even more that she didn't recognize. At her memorial service, each of the Animorphs said a short speech, and then the President of the United States also spoke. And Cassie thought, Rachel would have liked this in her own way. She would have laughed at how over the top it is, but she would have liked the attention. <laughs> when the ceremony was almost over, Cassie spotted him. She had, had, she had had an eye on the sky the whole time, and knew that if he was alive, he would be here. He dove down and landed on the small china urn, holding all few pounds of ash that was once Rachel. The man stepped forward, a man stepped forward to shoo him away, and Jake grabbed the guy's arm to stop him. Tobias leveled a stare at Naomi, who through sobs nodded her head, and then at Cassie, who said, yes, Tobias, she would want it. Tobias somehow summoned the strength to take off with the small urn. He caught a thermal and flew off. (laughs) They always went flying together, and this is their last flight together. (laughs) That's really depressing. I know! (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Ow. Oh. Also, it is confirmed that they were in California. It is confirmed they were in California. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you guessed correctly. Well, yeah, I had a lot of guesses, but um, yeah, couldn't figure out if they were in SoCal or NorCal, though. Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara. That's SoCal. How did they get to Sacramento, though? Because that's that's where the capital is. That's where the governor is. Oh, like in in Marco's last book. In yeah, how many miles is it? I mean, Sacramento is like seven hour drive from from the L.A. area. I mean, it does sound like they that Santa Barbara is where Jake ends up moving to be with Marco. It sounds like he did move away from where his parents were but that it was relatively close but maybe it could have been like an hour closer but still that's like far away but then if you're a duck you can fly pretty consistently at like i think between 30 and 40 miles an hour so you could do that in a day theoretically yeah that's true yeah i don't know i don't know i don't know i don't know that's that's why i was so confused most of the time i was like there's no way they could you know because that's halfway up the state (laughs) like it's a long flight. And my arms are really tired. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, California. Yeah. We did it. Yep, they're in California. California. Uh, California. <laughs> California. <laughs> um, oh my god, this next chapter. We have to talk about it. Yay. Because I told you back in book one to pay attention to this detail. Because it was funny. It's not really? important, but it is funny. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So we cut to one year later where Marco was doing well. He was taking on every talk show on the planet. He had endorsement deals. He had movie deals. All other sorts of deals. His uh, first month was the craziest with of all the interviews. Everybody wanted to know what happened and all the gritty details. But Marco had managed to sustain his career. And he talks about all of the talk shows that he did. And he was talking back in book one about using the morphing power to be like a, a stunt guy on TV shows. Oh. And he legit is doing it now. Yeah. <laughs> and like he talks about being on Letterman way back when. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Damn. 
It's fucking nuts. Marco was like, I have a career plotted out for myself. Oh my I will god! Make it happen. I love that. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> yes, uh, but whatever. So Marco's on all the talk shows, blah, blah, blah. He mentions that they wanted to book Jake, but Jake was like too dark and too depressing. <laughs> He's like Ben Wyatt. <laughs> 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 what's up ice town yes <laughs> oh my god sorry oh my god no that's so true <laughs> anyways yes jake goes ice town on this and cannot talk on the shows <laughs> but somehow cassie was way worse because every time they put her on she would talk for hours about how it was like some moral quandary instead of some cool battle and turned it into like but this is the righteous aspect of it, and here's the morality, and blah, blah, blah. And Marco's like, but me? I'm fun. I can banter. You want to trade jokes? I can trade jokes. Let's do it. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. It's so perfect for him. It is so perfect for him. And, like, he makes a comment, too, about how, like, I'm just as much of a hero as the rest of them. Yeah. And I thought, like, oh, my God, probably more so. Like, you, you, Jake is done with being the leader once the war is over. And it's yeah. almost like Marco becomes the leader after the war because he's the one that can, like, run the deals and, yeah. like, make the connections. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yep. I'm proud of him, too. I'm very proud of him as well. Even though he makes a few comments in this book that I didn't write down because I was like, he's a hero. I'm not going to hold it against him. <laughs> But then he keeps talking about all these starlets that he's dating and these... tossing aside. Yeah. What does he call one? Some sweet honey or something like that? Oh, no. He's still Marco. He's still Marco. I was like, come on, man. Like, come on. <laughs> it's funny, but still. Uh, <laughs> this is he's inappropriate. A, he's a freaking Robert Downey Jr. Not um, Iron Man. Fuck yeah, that's Robert boy. Downey Jr. Yeah, but like, what was the, the character's name? Uh, Tony Stark. He's like a Tony Stark playboy uh, now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. How many Maseratis does he have? Three? All. All. He has all the Maseratis. All Maseratis so belong many. to Marco. He's like, I just bought all the expensive cars to crash because I knew it would take more than one. <laughs> oh my god, I didn't even give the comparison. He bought all these nice cars and he's terrible <laughs> at driving. <laughs> Oh my god. He like didn't even take driver's ed. He was just like, hi, I'm Marco. Give me my license. Whee! Yeah, he's like, I'm 17 and I have Maseratis. I'm like, talk about the worst combination you could possibly do. This is literally the worst. You know he would be a guest on Top Gear. And, oh and, my god. And do the, the celebrity. Oh <laughs> my the god. Into Gambon. Oh my god. <laughs> And around the final corner, as he <laughs> crashes into the fucking field, like, <laughs> oh my god. Oh, shit. Oh my god, what I wouldn't give for the Marco Top Gear interview. Oh my god, that would be so good. And, like, I feel like he would, for the non-race car drivers, he would wind up going the fastest. Because he's like, I can't be killed. I'll just morph into something. Yeah. If I crash, it's not a problem. Yep. Marco. I'm so proud of you for being on Top Gear in this narrative we've created. <laughs> um, he also mentions that he wrote a book with, yes, with he some help from- Yes, he both did. Yeah, and he mentions he did it with the help from a ghostwriter. Mm-hmm. And I was like, was that a nod to all the ghostwriters that helped with this series? I hope so. Oh. I mean, I know a lot of people use ghostwriters, but- Yeah, and he mentions how his book did so much better than Cassie's because his was like- Marco the gorilla and hers was like the what was it the psychological it, aspect into the animal mind from an animorph blah 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 and oh my god was like, I'm a gorilla I would read the shit out of Cassie's book like it's probably Same. like super dry and boring and analytical but like holy shit I would read the shit out of it though. oh my god I feel like I would read her book like this, I would come out of it like, wow, this is really great. And I'd meet, read Marco's book and be like, that was a lot of fun, though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're good in different ways. For sure. But I would definitely, at this point, be signing up for the military to be like, I'm getting into the morphing area of the military. I will be there, whatever it takes. 
That would be my goal. Anyways, um, <laughs> yeah, so Marco's fun. He's doing a bunch of stuff. He's talking about all the deals that he's getting. He has, like, a deal with, like, Pepsi and, like, what else does he have? He has so many deals. Yeah. He just keeps taking fucking deals. Yeah, he fucking and sold out. <laughs> he sold the fuck out. And then he's like, I don't understand Cassie at all. Like, Walmart is begging on their hands and knees for her to take them for, like, their jeans or whatever. And she won't fucking do it. And then he starts saying, like, can you believe this chick? Instead, she's out saving the rainforest and her hork and going to Yellowstone. And the government gave her a part-time job. And she's going to school at night to be a vet. What the fuck is she doing with her life? And I'm like, <laughs> Marco. <laughs> oh, my God. That's like, it's like when... Harry Potter was over and Emma Watson became like this like advocate for all these causes and like Rupert Grint got an ice cream truck and was just like hanging out in his ice cream truck. <laughs> oh my god. It's exactly like that. <laughs> oh, oh fuck. My god. Oh. That's hilarious. But yeah, we find out through Marco's complaining that, like, everything Cassie set out to do with, like, the hork and the taxon and the rainforest, all of that came true. And then, because, like, we haven't gotten enough gut punches in this book, we find out that Arbron was able to go into the rainforest with the rest of the taxon, but within a year, he was shot by poachers and Aww. killed. Aww. That is awful. Um, the only silver lining to that is that because of what he did, his body or the remains of his body were sent off to the Andalite homeworld and he was given a quiet Andalite burial there. Yeah. And Marco was saying like he wouldn't have to like suffer the hunger of being a taxon anymore because he couldn't morph. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah. still like, holy shit. I hate yeah. poachers. Marco does. Oh, me too. Fuck, fuck poachers. I wish Arbron had have eaten them. <laughs> That's what I want. Arbron summons his army of snakes and they all just eat the poachers. <laughs> uh, yep. So that's how Arbron's story ends. After all of that, he was a hero to his people. He uh, was a hero to his adopted people. And he was just shot by poachers. That's so... Oh. Other shit that's going down is Andalite tourism is taking off. It wasn't super popular because of how expensive it is to travel, but all of the Andalites were coming to Earth, acquiring a human morph, and then hitting the mall to get Cinnabon. Oh my god, I love it so much. <laughs> I love it so much. And it's mentioned in the, the next chapter, but I didn't write it down, so I'm going to mention it here. The Andalites literally end up trading technology for a brand deal with Krispy Kreme. Like... Literally, hundreds of years advancement of technology because they want a Krispy Kreme franchise on the Andalite homeworld. Fucking amazing. That's This is the greatest wheeling and dealing that was ever done. <laughs> we will break Ciro's kindness for donuts. <laughs> Literally, they were like, and a paper hat? Fuck yeah, give them whatever oh the fuck God. they want. Weapons? Who cares? <laughs> Oh my god. Uh, I like how they like went on to specify that like the Andalite military are all pretty much dicks, but the Andalite people are totally chill. Yeah. <laughs> they were like they're formal, but they're nice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. My heart. I love it. Anyways, Marco just complains about Cassie for a while and all the shit she's doing, which like <laughs> By the way, how fucking amazing is Cassie? Like, I, advocating for the hork the taxon, and becoming a vet at night school? Yeah, what the <sighs> fuck? She's incredible, and she's a role model. She is a role model. I, I'm so proud of her. Me too. <laughs> and I like how the hork got all of Yellowstone. Yeah, they're like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like oh, that's the other thing. There's like a year and a half wait list to go to Yellowstone now because they had to limit the amount of people because everybody wanted to see the hork taking care of the redwood trees. Like, that's insane. <laughs> yeah. Isn't there already like a crazy like um, deadline to get into certain national parks? Or not a deadline, but um, like a waiting list? I think so, yeah. Because they're trying to like limit the the amount of people that go and like trash the park. 
Yeah, the corrosion. Yeah. And now it's even longer because of the hork yep. and the trees. Yup. <laughs> yes. Um, and then Marco starts telling us about Jake, which is really fucking depressing mm. because he tells us that Jake and Cassie haven't seen each other since the end of the war. And Marco's like, I don't know what happened between them, but I do know that Jake carries Tom, Rachel, and the 17,000 Yerks on his shoulders like a martyr with his albatross. Mm-hmm. And Marco's like, I hung out with him a few times, but even when I do, sometimes he'll sound like the old Jake, but like, it always feels like he's out of sync with the rest of the world. He's either a step ahead or a step behind, but he's never in the present with you. And Marco's like, I worried about him. Like, you know, when I was driving off in one of my Maseratis or eating out with some insanely beautiful girl at a fantastic (laughs) restaurant or at my beach house by the pool or in my New York apartment. (laughs) Marco. I think about Jake. (laughs) Marco. (laughs) Oh, you troll. There's really a whiplash here between. I'm really worried about Jake, but look at all the shit I have. (laughs) And like. He never hesitates from talking about it, like, my mansion, <laughs> with my butler, with my Maserati. Oh, my God. You precious Oh, my boy. God. <laughs> you are the worst slash the best. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I say the worst in a loving way. Of course. Uh, but, yeah, he says he hasn't seen Jake or Cassie in a few months when he gets a phone call from his agent that they would all be meeting up again in the Netherlands for the trial of Visor 1. Dun, dun, dun. So let's get through this next chapter because there is a lot of shit that we have to talk about. Okay, we cut to Cassie's perspective. She meets Marco at the hotel in the Netherlands and she's like, hey, have you seen Jake? And she didn't really know if she wants to see Jake. Like, she's like, this is going to be weird. You know, the last time that we saw each other, you know, Jake wanted to be with me, but now that wasn't how it was. He said we'd be together after the war and now we're just avoiding each other. And Marco's like, oh, I, I haven't seen him. And, and Cassie goes, oh, well, when did you get here? And Marco's like, here? Like, as this hotel? I'm, I'm staying at a private villa nearby to keep groupies away. And Cassie laughs like, haha, good joke. And then she goes, you're completely serious, aren't you? And Marco's like, oh, come on. When have I ever been completely serious? Oh. And oh, I loved it so much. Um. Cassie feels this wave of affection for Marco, who she admitted she had never been that close to, and she felt like the they were only really connected through Jake. But now they were connected because they were the only two real survivors of this war. I loved that. I did too. Uh... Um, and it only gets better from here because they go out to grab some lunch. And when they sit down, Cassie starts asking, you know, when was the last time you saw Jake? How often do you see him? And Marco's like, you mean like, how often do I see him? Like when he knows about it? Or like how often do I see him all together? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he's a total creep. (laughs) And Cassie too. Cassie's like, you're spying on him? And Marco's like... Sometimes I just fly around and he happens to be in my line of sight. I don't know, man. Oh my God, Marco. (laughs) Yes. And Cassie's trying to press him for details. And Marco kind of gives this like half ass, like, I'm not a psychologist. And then Cassie's like, you're smart. You're observant. You're his best friend. You know what's going on. Tell me what's going on. And she's starting to push more, but the waitress comes back and drops off their drinks and then hesitates, giving Marco this, like, I know you smile. And Marco's like, oh, she wants me. She definitely wants me. And Cassie's like, okay, cut the fucking bullshit and tell me about Jake. Like, (laughs) stop it. (laughs) Um, And Marco kind of goes off into this, like, half super concerned, half derogatory kind of thing where he's like, you know, it... Every time I see him, he just seems like a half deflated helium balloon or like a flashlight that's, you know, dim. He's I think he's depressed, like truly depressed. And then he says sometimes he just drives around in the free Jaguar they gave him. And Marco's like, by the way, the Jag. (laughs) And Marco's like, by the way, I would have killed Jake myself if he declined that free Jaguar. That's very important that he took that. (laughs) Um And then he just, like, dips back into this whole, like, oh, but, you know, he just hangs around the house or he goes to talk to her. And they both are like, her. Her. (laughs) 
And Marco's like, but he doesn't even like talk, which is just worse. He's just sitting silently. And sometimes I think he's only there waiting for Tobias to show up, which is even worse. Oh. And then they start talking about like, Rachel would fucking hate that. And they're like, yeah, for sure. What do you think she would say? And Marco's like, oh, she'd tell him to shake it off. And Cassie's like, I don't know what she would tell him. Like, I can't, I can't observe that. And uh, then they start talking about, like, how they had been morphing. Like, you know, Marco admits already that he's been spying on Jake and morph. And, like, you know, Marco asks Cassie, have you been morphing? She goes, oh, yeah, of course. It's, like, easier to get around sometimes. And then they're like, I don't think Jake has since, since. And this sparks this idea with Cassie about using morphing to get someone out of a funk. Oh. And Marco's like, yeah, morph therapy. Hell yeah. And that was something you asked me like yes. 30 books ago. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. So when you asked me that, I was like, oh, uh, we won't get to talk about this until the last book. Yay. I did it. Yeah. You did it. Yeah, they totally. Morph therapy could be a thing. Mm-hmm. For sure. And they use it, kind of. We'll find out. Right. Next time. No, there is no next time. This is it. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Anyways, I was so excited when they started talking about that. I'm like, yeah, Casey, you mentioned this like in book four, probably, honestly. (laughs) Yay. (laughs) And here we are. Although it seems that when I was asking about, like, if whenever they morph back to human, if they, like, don't age, if they just revert back to their, like, age that they were when they acquired the morphing, um, that doesn't seem to have held up, though. Because throughout this book, they mentioned several times that, like, everyone is older and taller and whatever. That's true, but they hadn't morphed much. Although, the one that, um, that I always thought of was they never mentioned that when Tobias morphs to human again... That he looks yeah. like. Him. They just say it was Tobias, so. That's yeah. true. I was wondering about that, if he would go back to being a little little 15 year old or whatever. <laughs> so they all look like they're they're in their 20s now. And their 20s <laughs> just just little 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 like... <laughs> oh, it's just like number five from the Umbrella Academy. Oh. <laughs> yes. He's like 60, Precisely. but. <laughs> he's trapped in a 13 year old. But also kid. 10. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. Okay. Okay, so they're in the Netherlands. We cut to Jake's perspective. He is in court sitting next to Marco, and beyond Marco was Cassie, who he had exchanged awkward hugs with when he got there, and nothing else. He'd really been dreading this for months. He didn't know what to say to her or to anyone at this point. And he starts talking about how off he feels. Like, I'm always confused. I'm always distracted. I always feel like there's something I should be focusing on, but I can't remember what it is. And he's just, he really doesn't get why he's so messed up. Um, And then he starts looking around this courtroom. He looks up at the lectern where the Andalites had managed to make a small prison box for Visor 1 that had a portable Kindrone array, sight and sound emulator so they could talk and Visor 1 could see in some capacity. The only thing Jake didn't understand was why it was painted a shade of lavender. And he says it was lavender for some Andalite reason. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know. I, I want to I want to think it had like little flowers on it too. Oh, like, like they built him a beautiful little purple box. Yeah. Like, oh, well, here you it's go. like a little kid's suitcase or something. <laughs> <laughs> like a Polly Pocket. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Open for a surprise. <laughs> Except it's just War Criminal Visor 1. <laughs> <laughs> Who is now a box. Yeah, but if you put him on the little elevator and crank the little thing, oh. he'll go up. <laughs> oh my god. I love Fucking that. Polly Pocket. <laughs> That's, that is how that went. <laughs> so as Jake's looking around, he is noticing that there's... This courtroom is just filled with intelligence officials from every nation, and there's undercover security on top of the plain clothes security outside and, like, the normal security. There's one bathroom stall-sized area where every camera from, like, every news station that could possibly fit in there was crammed in, and he's like, the whole world is watching. <laughs> so the court starts reading charges against Visor 1, and it takes a long fucking time because there's, like, 25 charges... And they're reading, like, all the counts of these charges, and it's, like, torturing people, murder, general (laughs) war crimes. Impersonating (laughs) a priest from the Church of England. (laughs) 
<laughs> Impersonating an official. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of fucking crimes. But this international court that they're in does not have the death penalty. So what he's facing is over 800 years in a prison. Um, and finally, after they read all these charges, Jake is called to the stand as the first witness. And he gets up really stiff-legged from sitting for so long and walks up to the box. He is introduced, and then the defense immediately objects. And they're saying it's on the grounds that to achieve true justice and a fair trial, that Jake should also be on trial because he killed thousands of Yerks and he should be tried as a war criminal if Vizor 1 is. The judge shuts that shit down. The prosecution is like livid. Everybody's pissed about this, but the damage is done to Jake because this is just his greatest fear realized. Mm -hmm. And so they start asking him questions and they start very simply now. Uh, Like they ask if he's okay after he's like accused of this because he visibly reacts to it. And he's like, I'm fine. Let's continue. And the very first question they ask is, how did you become aware of an alien presence on Earth? And Jake starts spinning into these flashbacks where he's getting these flashes of like all of them at the mall walking home, going through the construction site with everybody, Elfangor, everything that's happened to them. And every question they ask him, he just cannot answer. He's having these horrific flashbacks. And he was only on the stand for about an hour. But by the time he left, he was exhausted. He felt like he had let down the entire world. And he just headed straight back to his hotel room to sit on his bed, putting his head in his hands. Mm-hmm. Um, he's interrupted by a noise behind him. And when he looks up, he sees a gorilla, Marco, of course. And then he sees out of the corner of his eye, Cassie morphing in this one area of his room and acts too. And then Marco delivers a blow to the side of his head that knocks him out. Jake wakes up falling into water. It wasn't a far drop, but when he hit, he sunk about 10 feet and struggled, cold, wet, shocked, not knowing which way was up. He was tangled in his own clothes and he pulled them off. He kicked off his shoes. He struggled towards the surface. He got in half a breath when a wave came crashing down on top of him, filling his mouth with salt water again. He was pushed back under the water, and finally he says, Dolphin, I have to go dolphin. So he starts morphing, and his skin goes gray like a corpse, his legs twisting together. He's almost there, and he's not cold anymore. He tries to surface slowly, but the waves are too high, so he has to dive down and then power up, breaking the barrier between sea and sky, and then diving again and jumping again. He goes over and over, trying to exhaust his body, wanting to run out of energy for once. He fired some sonar clicks, and he sees three dolphins nearby, but keeping their distance. He keeps jumping until he wears himself out, and by the time this happens, he was near enough to the beach that he powered up onto the sand, beaching himself, and then demorphed. The others follow behind him. For a moment, they're all standing there in their old morphing suits, looking at each other. Jake breaks the silence and accuses them of thinking that they were pretty clever for this little scheme. And Marco cuts in, more like desperate. He tells Jake that he has had his head up his butt for a long time, which is none of their business, unless, of course, it's their business because he's affecting something like the trial of Visor 1. And Jake just goes, she called me a war criminal. And Cassie says she's wrong. And Marco follows up saying, you did what you had to do, man. And Axe finally contributes that he was the one that pointed out the possibility of flushing the pool to Jake. So it, it was on his shoulders. And Jake argues, no, I made that call. I pulled the plug. So how is this defense lawyer wrong? How am I not a war criminal? Cassie argues that she's thought a lot about this. And they're all like, yeah, yeah, of course you have. Of course you did, Cassie. And she starts to say, I've had to think about it because we took the same actions. We did the same things. And I had to make peace with it. And Jake realizes that while he's hanging on to every word she's saying, all he can really focus on is what it felt like to kiss her. But he shakes himself out of it to say, so what you're saying is, as long as you're playing defense, it's not possible to commit a war crime? That's pretty close to saying the winner gets to make the rules, because it's the winner that writes history. Cassie grabs his arm and says, no, Jake. Before this, no human had ever harmed a yerk. We've never done a single thing to them. And Jake says, so we're the good guys. And Marco and Axe go, yeah, yeah, we're the good guys, Jake. For sure we're the good guys. And Jake goes, good, but my problem's a little more personal than that. And Axe is the one that's like, what do you mean? Jake explains that when he flushed the pool ship, he wasn't thinking, oh, this is a harsh and terrible thing, but I'm justified to do it because after all, you're the victim. Jake challenges them. You know what I thought? And Marco steps up to him, gets right in his face and says, 
You thought, die, you filthy worms. Feel the fear, Yerks. Feel the pain. Feel the helplessness. You wanted them to suffer, and the idea of them suffering and dying made you happy. You were thrilled. You were high. And Jake goes, yeah, pretty much word for word, that's it. And Cassie winces and looks away. And Marco dismissed it, saying, you don't get to be a war criminal just by thinking bad thoughts. It's your actions that count, and you are acting in self-defense. Cassie wants to agree so badly, but she can't bring herself to do it, so she just says nothing. But Jake notices that, and he notices the sideways look that she gives him. Axe calls him Prince Jake and says, Well, I'm not human. It seems like this would be up to humans to decide the morality of your actions. And their assessment is quite clear. The Andalites agree with this assessment. At the end of the day, Jake stopped the war and saved many, many humans and Andalite lives. Jake deflates. He's suddenly exhausted. He tries a, well, that was that kind of gesture and, like, looks wildly towards the ocean. Like, he wants to say, you know, this was great. But he doesn't really have the words. He doesn't really know what to think, like, other than this was the happiest I felt since watching Rachel kill Tom. But I can't say that out loud. So instead, he just kind of peters out. And after a moment, he says, anyways, I'll be good tomorrow on the stand. And the trial continued. And once it concluded, Visor 1 was charged on 22 of the 25 accounts, and he will likely never be released from the prison in Kansas that was built for him. The animals that were alive and available all testified after Jake, and they won. Yay! <coughs> yeah, that's pretty brutal. Jake, go to therapy! <laughs> I mean, like, I don't know what fucking therapist could, like, help you. I don't know, man. But just try to go to therapy. Yeah, you clearly have, like, PTSD or something. <laughs> I'm not a psychologist. I don't Very know. clearly. Well, I, th- I mean, I think it's really, it's super clear that he has depression, he has PTSD, he's deeply, deeply affected by everything that went down. I'm actually, like, you know, Marco earlier made a point to say, like, Jake was depressed, but he wasn't into, like, drugs or anything. And I'm kind of yeah. surprised he didn't turn to drugs. Yeah. Not to say, like, everyone th- with depression turns to drugs, but, like, I don't know. Also, this is a kid's book. <laughs> well, it is. But they mentioned that he didn't, like, turn to drugs or alcohol in the book. Like, yeah. it would have been fair game. Like, he has, like, no visible, like, coping mechanism. Kind of. Like... Cassie's throwing herself into her work, probably, and, like, Marco's, you know, genuinely happy, which I'm very happy for him, but, like, you know, he's got other things to keep him busy. Um, Yeah. So, like, the fact that Jake doesn't have any sort of, like, outlet for that is, like, I don't know, is interesting. And, I mean, none of their coping mechanisms are, I guess, like, super healthy, but I I don't know. I'm not... A psychologist, psychiatrist, I don't know. I'm also neurotypical, so I can't speak to that, but wondering aloud to myself and to you. Yeah, and to me. To you. But dolphin therapy kind of worked in a way. Yeah. A little bit. No. It was a quick fix. It was a band-aid. Yeah. Now turn into a puppy, because they're always happy. Little puppy. Little puppy. Just a little puppy. He ain't done nothing wrong. He's just a puppy. <laughs> uh. Yeah. Actually, <clears throat> sorry, now that you've said that, that brings up an interesting point of how they always mention that the Andalites are always kind of like happier than humans and like humans are a lot more, they think like in a much darker mm-hmm. kind of a way. So that probably explains why Axe is like doing pretty okay. I'm shocked even- that Axe didn't stay on earth i mean i guess not since he was promoted to prince and they gave him a ship and shit to do but like i i was yeah i was really predicting that he was gonna stay on earth and eat cinnamon buns for the rest of his life (laughs) we're like yeah even if he didn't do that even if he went on this mission i'm surprised that he didn't ask any of them to come with him like, said to Tobias or to Jake. Like, yeah. Not Marco or Cassie, but, like, well, maybe Cassie. I don't know. Huh. I don't know either. Yeah. But, like, he mentions that part of this whole thing is, like, Axe basically got the 
last good job that the military had because the Andalites were basically disbanding the military right. now that the war was over. Yeah. So he's like, legit, everybody else gets to be like transport or they have to be like a blockade where they just sit in space doing nothing forever. And I am the one person that gets to just fly about the galaxy like some sort of crazy adventurer looking for trouble. That's my job is just to walk around the galaxy looking for trouble. Yeah. But like the fact that he was so disgraced pretty much throughout the entire series from like his first book where he took the fall for his brother like i'm i'm shocked that he got anything from the andalites i thought they would be more you know stingy than that well i mean that's like a part of exposing everything that had happened the way that they did and like patching into the citizen network instead of just the military channels like it had to be to, like, really, like, drive home, like, Axe did all, like, because the whole Andalite military is trying to take over their Yerks, and they're like, Elfangor's little brother did it. Mm-hmm. He helped the five humans win. So, like, it has to be forgiven because he's just accomplished what the entire yeah. Andalite military couldn't. So, yeah. But that being said, I could see why they were still like, okay, now go cavort around the galaxy and, like, get the fuck out of our hair. We don't want you around here. Yeah, or I thought they were gonna, like, say, you have to stay on Earth. You can still be, like, an ambassador to between the Andalites and the and the humans, but, like, you're still... Yeah. I mean, like, it felt like he would be. Yeah. I, yeah. Especially since that, that was part of the um, the initial agreement. It was Axe got the four morph cubes and he was the Earth liaison. Yeah. So, like, what happened where he got, like, promoted or demoted out of that? Like, what was the deal? I don't know. We, d- we never find out. These are just questions that... Yeah. <laughs> uh. I wonder if he just watched his whole team fall apart and thought, like, I don't want to be here to see this. Oh, no! I mean, that's kind of what he was like with Jake when Jake started getting really depressed and refusing to lead the team after his parents were taken. He was basically like, my prince is fucked up and I don't want to be here with this right now. I'm just going to take my cinnamon buns and go. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Taking my chocolate chip cookies and getting the fuck out of here. He just noped out of there, just like Tobias. Yeah. That's the other thing. What the fuck happened between him and Tobias? Right? Why do we never... <sighs> They're shorms! Yeah! I don't know. I like to think that, like, Tobias snoped out of there, and nobody could find him, and Axe was like, okay, he needs his space, and then he went off to do Andalite things, and they, like Jake and Cassie, just kind of lost touch. Yeah. And just never got the chance to, like... Axe never got the chance to, like, try and go look for him. But, like... That's that's just my interpretation, maybe. No, I think that that's probably really accurate. Like, that's probably what happened. But I'm also really disappointed that we never got the scene of Axe trying to reach out to Tobias before he left his Earth liaison position. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not like Marco was recounting that, like, Axe looked for him for, you know, months and just couldn't find him or anything right. like that. Right. Uh, I'm sad now. Shorms forever? Oh. Question mark? Doing stuff together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, this is fucking depressing. Wow. But that's the whole point at the end of the day. We'll get there. Yeah. We'll get there. Yeah. Um, now comes the weird part. And... Now comes the weird part where we're two years after the one year later. So we're three years out from the end of the war, two years out from the trial of Vizzer 1. So we cut to Axe in charge of his ship. He's cavorting around the galaxy looking for trucks. He was (laughs) currently ordering some (laughs) trucks. He uh, was currently ordering some of his pilots to go in with full sensor array and lit up. And he mentions that, like, part of why he's doing this, he explains everything to his crew, like... If they're friendly and we're approaching the ship that seems dead in the water, then we want them to know we're here. And if they're not friendly, let them think we have two careless fighters and then we'll go in and fuck them up. And he knows that his second in command, Menderash, doesn't approve of the way that he does this. Like, he's like, oh, he'd rather have, like, 
you know, me act really aloof and godlike like the other captains of the ship. But I think that having better educated officers to rush into situations with is much better for me in the long run. Yay. Probably right. I like that. His too. leadership style, very good. I love it. Uh, but, you know, Menderash is like, oh, this is weird and I don't like it. It's not the end of the way. This isn't, this isn't the way that we want it to be. I have complaints. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, Menderash. God, Menderash. I actually really end up liking Menderash. Yeah, me too. I don't know why. <laughs> me too. But still. <laughs> I'm still going to give him shit right now. Yeah. Um, so his fighters that are scouting it out report back that the ship seems to be completely dead. Sensors show no signs of life. And Hax is like, well, I'm going to go and investigate. Because I'm not bored, per se. But I am pretty bored. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, he was basically like, I feel bad for saying I'm bored, but I'm definitely bored. Definitely, for sure. No. I'm just wandering around the galaxy doing nothing. Curiosity killed the cat, my dude. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh, man. And uh, he does mention that he is, after all, the Aximili of Earth. So he does have the best gig in the galaxy, but still he's bored. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they basically, he explains that his whole assignment is just following whispers of ghosts and rumors around the galaxy. And he's like, right now we're following this, like, blade ship rumor, but the Skritna aren't really reliable sources of information. So we're kind of following up, but we don't think it's anything. And so Axe gets on this ship to go investigate. And then one of his pilots goes, whoa, there's something really weird here. There's some DNA on the ship that doesn't belong. And they are reading it as something that might be from Earth. And Axe is like, my heart started beating very fast, but I tried to calm myself down. And they're like, they're like, this is weird. Run it again. This is probably wrong. And Axe is like, I'm trying not to get excited, but this is a really good lead on this blade ship. So they run it again. They find out they have a 98% certainty match for Earth DNA of a polar bear. Menderash reaches out then and says, Axe, you should consider returning to the main ship. And he's like, why? Do you sense danger? And Menderash is like, yes, I do. And Axe is like, I agree. I too sense danger, but I'm already here, so I'm going for no! it. No! And then we cut away from Axe. Get out of there. So we do another wacky ass cut where we get to Jake, who's teaching a class, and he's in the middle of a lecture where he's telling his students, like, Animal instincts can be very difficult to overcome, so it's very important that you never go into battle with an untested morph. And one of his students, named Santarelli, says, But you did it! And Jake goes like, I did a lot of stupid shit. I think the government was hoping that you would take away the good habits and not the bad ones from me. And we find out this is Jake's life now. He's teaching in some forgotten marine base way out in the desert. And he had moved to Santa Barbara, Barbara, finally, out of his parents' house at Marco's insistence and Marco's manager's insistence and how many others' insistence. He also wrote a book and just got the fuck out of there. <laughs> Basically, everybody's forcing him to do shit because he doesn't want to do anything on his own. Aww. Jake did agree to write this book eventually because he wanted to tell the story of Tobias and Rachel, who are often considered the forgotten animorphs. Aww. Which is really depressing. Just like the third guy on the Apollo mission that I don't remember his name because I'm awful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly like the that. one who didn't get to go on the moon's surface because he had to stay with the other thing. <laughs> so. You have to stay with the ship. You don't get to go to the moon. Instead of can you fucking imagine though getting all the way to the moon and not going out on the surface? Uh, I'd be like, fuck all y'all, goodbye. I mean, there's stuff to take away from that mission. At least you get to go into space. But just because I don't want to perpetuate this bad behavior, I'm gonna look up who it is. Neil okay. Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins. God, they're all old except for Neil, who you I mean, think is Mike dead. Collins's people. Mike Collins's people. Um, <laughs> He's literally three feet. Okay, probably more. I don't know what the clearance under the the rocket was. It looked very tall. Maybe nine feet. You're like ten feet away from the surface of the moon. I'd jump the fuck down. You would just like run out, like touch the surface, and then run back in. That's it. Thirty yeah. seconds. Just touch one toe to the surface. Be like, I'm here. I did it. I touched the moon. Goodbye. Goodbye. Like, 
Yeah. Goodbye. I touched the moon. Oh, Goodbye. No. And as soon as you step out of the thing, it explodes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and you're like, oh shit, that's why we had to stay in there. Hi, Lena's here. In honor of Fluffer McKitty, who is not in this book. But should be. Yes. <gasps> Hi. Good girl. She's gonna wreck everything. Anyway. Yay! Axe wanders into implied doom, and it's bad. Yes, and Jake is teaching, which is a different kind of implied doom. <laughs> um, so yeah, he writes the book for Tobias and Rachel, and um, then he's like just kind of in awe that somebody who didn't even finish high school officially was teaching this top secret class of brilliant fit soldiers, some of them twice his age. He's like... I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just talking about morphing. <laughs> and if this isn't an example of how I feel in day-to-day life, then I don't know what it is. <laughs> and we graduated high school, college even. Yeah, but I still don't know what I'm doing. Ever. How fun is that? Hooray. We find out that part of the reason that Jake is teaching this class and that like the military is really working on and like this is the world military like jake has people from all over in his classroom like france and germany and blah 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 all over the world and part of the reason that they are doubling down on this type of security is that terrorists have like made a resurgence like the appearance of appearance of aliens has brought out all of these cults that are like the doomsday is here and all of these terrorist groups that are like it's end days Hail and like Zorp. all of these crazy people yeah exactly <laughs> Let's book the park because the world is ending. (laughs) Yeah. And then, like, there's a bunch of racists that are like, you know what? People are cool, but fuck the hork So, like, then there's all these racist attacks on the hork Like, shit's just gone awry. Yes. Basically, this year that we're living in now happened in Animorphs this year. Yay. Everybody's gone terrorist and racist, and there's nothing we can do about it except morph away the pain. Oh, my God. Anyways. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Jake's having that kind of identity crisis. And uh, then he starts talking about how he's, like, really excited that it's Friday because he's, like, ready to fucking head home and stop being a teacher. Friday. Is... Friday. <laughs> Gotta get down on Friday. Gotta get down on Friday. <laughs> Yep, Jake's having a Rebecca Black moment. <laughs> How sad is it that I knew Rebecca Black, but not the third guy to go to the moon? <laughs> oh no, what does that say about society <laughs> as a whole? I don't know, but it says that I'm a shitty person. No. For sure. <laughs> now I'll never forget it, because I know it's the same as Hedvig with Mike Collins's people. With <laughs> Collins's people. Mike Collins's people. It's because he doesn't have a cool name. Like, come on. Buzz Aldrin and Mike. (laughs) That's the guy from Toy Story. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I've inserted like 10 Parks and Rec references. I'm so sorry. (laughs) Do not be. Oh, fuck me. (laughs) So Jake's leaving for the weekend. He's done with all of his students' bullshit. I get it. I feel you. I hear you, Joanna. <laughs> so <laughs> he's leaving. <laughs> he gets to a uh, Humvee because basically the the military is like flying him in on a private jet from his home to the desert every day, and like he gets into the Humvee to go to the airplane, and he's gotten used to like waiting so that they open the door for him because they get mad at him if he opens the door himself, and. He's, like, waiting for this guy to come around, and they're having, like, a, how's the weather today? It's a little hot. And Jake's like, but it's a dry heat, and I just wanted to punch him in the (laughs) fucking face. Why are you so bored? I'm tired of hearing. I'm tired of dry heat. I can't take it anymore. If one more person tells me dry heat isn't as bad as wet heat, I'll fucking strangle them. Oh, my God. I've had enough. Anyways. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Sorry. This is my personal life bleeding into this podcast. Oh, no. Whatever. J- the, the, Jake's distracted because one of the Marines touches his earpiece and starts saying, what? Oh, I'll ask him. Okay. And so Jake looks over at him. He's like, what? What the fuck? And the guy's like, some Andalites have just landed and they're demanding to see you. And Jake's like, great, bring him over, but let's find some shade. So they get to the shade and a few minutes later, a truck comes by pulling a horse trailer with Andalites in it. Cute. <laughs> 
which is the greatest fucking thing ever. And Jake's like, they've never objected to this weird mode of transport, and it's easier than trying to cram them into a car, so cool. They just roll up in, like, a flatbed of a truck. You know what would be the worst is if an Andalite didn't want to load and you had to put, like, a lunge line strap on their butt and start, like... (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. The shit we do to horses. Anyways, um... So, yes, uh, these two Andalites show up. One of them is Menderash, and he tells Jake, we're the two survivors of the Intrepid. And Jake goes, Axe's ship? And he goes, oh, sorry, my, uh, Prince Axe and Millie's ship? And they're like, yeah, that one. And Jake's like, so Axe is dead. And they're like, currently, he's only considered missing, and we have reason to believe he's still alive and a prisoner. But what really sells Jake on this next part is when Menderash mentions a blade ship. Now Jake is all the fuck in. So they go inside to the, I assume, classroom. And Menderash is recounting the story for Jake about how, you know, by all accounts, they thought the ship was dead. And Menderash is blaming himself a lot. Like, he feels really guilty about letting Axe go. And, like, it was for sure his fault, even though Axe was the one that went and outranked him. So, whatever. Um, they boarded the dead ship with no great strain. Axe eventually found the DNA sample that they had read, and it was a few hairs that seemed white, but when Axe picked them up, they were actually translucent and hollow. (gasps) And the next second, Axe said, draw your weapons, and from the dead ship emerged this blade ship. The alien ship was firing. There was an attack. The whole ship got blasted apart. The Andalite ship got blasted apart. Um, Menderesh recounts that the technical officer was sucked out into space and froze before the four shields could come up. The computer systems were down. There was blood everywhere. And in the chaos, Menderesh heard Axe call out one thing, and it wasn't through the computer. It was his thought speak through space. And he yelled, Jake, just that. The ship, alien ship took off and continued to fire on the Intrepid, which then started taking damage as well from Norsk pirates, and they found the disabled ship and were like, oh, fuck yeah, free for all. Um, The Andalites had let out a plea for help, but by the time help arrived, there were only the two survivors and just basically pieces of the Andalite ship left. The last they saw of the vessel that had Axe, it was entering Kelbrid space. And Jake goes, what's that? And Menderash freezes and kind of looks around. And Jake quickly says, all these Marines, get the fuck out of the room. Once they're alone, Menderash says, it's another species that the Andalites have had an agreement with for forever. They're super aggressive, they're warlike, and the only rules are that we cannot enter Kelbrids' space and the Kelbrids cannot enter our space. Reavers! what do they look like? Basically, it feels like Reavers. Yeah, like when he goes onto the ship and there's like no one there and it's super spooky. I was just like, there's fucking Reavers on this ship, man. Get out. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's exactly what it felt like. Oh, my God. But yeah. So Jake is asking what Kelbrids look like, what their ships look like. Menderash is like, we do not know. And then Jake's like, well, it makes sense that they'd want an Andalite prisoner to begin to know their enemy. And Jake's like, so why couldn't you go after him? And like... You know, why Why can't we, like, make this mission happen? And Menderash is like, because, Jake, no Andalite can enter Kelbrid space. And Jake's like, well, what about non-Andalites? And Menderash is like, I can't say for sure, but it could not be an Andalite ship that enters Kelbrid space either. And Jake's like, surely there must be a Yerk ship hanging around. And Menderash is like, well... We did see a Yerk Intrepid type ship in orbit above the Earth that's like not super well guarded and may have weapons. We don't know. We can't say for sure. And this is like the most. Yeah, exactly. This is the most insane part. Menderash starts morphing human and Jake's like, okay, yeah, but you're still an Andalite. And Menderash goes, in two hours, I will not be. Oh, no. Like. What happened between Axe and Menderash to make Menderash love him so? And, like, was him hearing the thought speak from that far away, like, that bond, (gasps) like, that they talked about between Gefinilin and Myrtle? Oh! Like, what happened? Oh, I like that. That would be amazing. But, like, now I want the adventures of Axe and Menderash. Why don't I have it? I want it. I want it now. Give it oh, to me. No, give it to me. Come even, on, give it to me. I didn't even think of that. Oh. <laughs> Speaking of Myrtle, I was hoping he would show up again. 
Me too. Oh, sad. But yeah. he got what he wanted. And Gefenelin, but I assume he's gone. He did. Mm, sad. I would assume he'd be dead yeah. as well. Oh. I was hoping we'd find out for sure what happened to Homer. <gasps> Homer. He got taken in by the chi. Oh, that's terrible. I hope it wasn't Eric. I hope it was Mr. <sighs> King. Because Eric's the shittiest chi. He is the shittiest chi. <sighs> So, whatever. I guess I'll move along. <laughs> okay, let's go to another super fucking depressing chapter. Mm. So we cut to Cassie's perspective, and she is climbing a mountain following Ronnie, who is her counterparts of sorts for the state of California. But also they were dating. <laughs> um, also, she's, she she's like resist- 19 and he's like 26 or something. Oh, yeah, he's six years older than her, so he would be 25 and she's 19. Also, his legs are really nice, apparently. I was really uncomfortable. He has great legs. <laughs> I was very unsure about all of this. And she also describes him as being like, you know, he was like a man's man, like, didn't talk about his feelings and walked in the woods. And I'm like, what is, why? That's not your type? What the fuck? I don't know. <laughs> A man's man. See, whenever I think anyone says man's man, I instantly think like, oh, he likes men. That's all I think about. Oh, I just think about the soap commercials. Huh? The uh, body wash commercials where he's like, now I'm on a beach. Blah, blah. I don't know. Why, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, Look at your man. Yeah. Now back I at have... me. Now back at your man. Now back to me. That one? Yes. That's probably exactly why I think it's a man's I'm man. A it's because of that. <laughs> I just, I just think a man's man is a gay man. Like, just off the top of my head. <laughs> be a man, you be must be swift as, as a coursing river. river. <laughs> yes. Uh, so he's a man's man, whatever the fuck that means. Yeah, we don't really find out much of anything about Ronnie. He kind of sounds stupid. <laughs> I, it's hard, though. Like, I don't know. It's, he's the I boring guy you settled Ronnie. for. Yeah, exactly. He's a boring guy that you settled for and not... He's no Jake. And he knows you settled for him. <laughs> yeah, but, like, she's Cassie the Animorph, so what's he gonna do? Break up with her? Uh, it's all very sad. <laughs> Maybe he's really great, and we're <laughs> just, like, not giving him a chance. We're just trash-talking him because, much like whenever a breakup happens, we've picked sides and we picked Jake. Why? I don't know. <gasps> but we did. Oh. Now here we are. Oh. Sure, Ronnie's very nice. Whatever. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure, he's super nice. Stupid legs. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> um, yeah, so she's talking about Ronnie and how she had resisted dating for a while, but eventually she's like, I have to move on. And like, you know, we're hanging out and it's all cool. Whatever. Um, and she's like talking about how she's just really been working on moving on with her life. And she was like, not that I, I'm not going to be an Animorph. I'm always going to be Cassie the Animorph. But now I also work for the government and I safeguard the hork And, you know, that's important too. And she starts talking about how what they were doing now is they were scoping out a new valley for the growing population of hork And then she starts talking about how she had become a pretty proficient hiker as well now and she's like walmart had stopped coming after me for deals but now patagonia was calling and then she started thinking about how like her wardrobe isn't fashionable but rachel would have to come up with a whole new line of material to work with to mock her wardrobe and like that just hit really close for like i i love that moment of their friendship of cassie just remembering rachel and like thinking of this fondly and thinking like how she'd have to like come up with like all new shit for i just yeah. that was super sweet i love that she's remembering her friend and she's not remembering her friend as like crazy rachel or dark rachel she's remembering all the best parts of her and that's so good i love that i love this so much like this is one of the moments where i'm like i, I really i appreciate Cassie's perspective in this Mm. moment on their friendship. Yeah. But uh, all happy things are not to be. Out of the corner of her eye, she spots a falcon. And while she's not sure how she knows, she immediately does. And she says, Ronnie, a friend of mine is dropping in. And he kind of does this like, oh, looks behind him, like, oh, looks up the mountain trail. And Cassie just like points up towards the falcon. And Ronnie's like, oh, 
I'll just go on ahead and wait for you. And she's like, great, thanks. And then there's this, like, I don't know why this hit me the way it did, but Jake lands in front of Cassie, immediately starts demorphing, and basically says, Cassie, stand in front of me in case this morph goes weird. I don't want to roll down the mountain and die. And, like, I don't know if it was the combination of Jake can still be so vulnerable in front of her, because that's a very vulnerable ask of him to do, or the fact that he's, like, just did like an order like he was still the leader jake or like i don't know what this combination was that i reacted to but i loved it i didn't see why it needed to be there i don't see it did yeah like (laughs) i was like he could have just landed on a branch and started morphing but i appreciated it i thought it was really funny i don't know why it just it hit me in a way that like made me laugh and made me like them in this interaction yeah it it seems so it seems so normal it seems like you know, they're back in the old days and he's just coming back from some mission and he's like, oh, hey, can you, like, just do this really quick thing for me? Yeah, cover me. Aw. That's actually a really good point that it's, like, kind of like they're back in the old days because that's exactly what Jake is like in this interaction. Mm-hmm. Like, Yeah, he's back in that mindset of, back. like, I have a mission. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. I like it. Um, so he gets demorphed and he's standing in front of her and Cassie says he's taller and he's bigger, but he's Jake. And she immediately says, what's the problem? And Jake winces knowing that like, oh, Cassie probably shouldn't only expect problems from me. Like I probably should have done better with this relationship, (laughs) (laughs) but it's too late now. (laughs) And, uh, so he tells her that Axe has been taken and Cassie immediately grabs Jake's arm and was like, oh my God, what happened? And so he recounts the story for her and also the problems like Andalites can't go into Kelbert's space and vice versa. And Cassie goes, so the Andalites are asking you to go? And Jake gives this very Rachel-like smile. And Cassie says she's never noticed before how similarly they can smile before he goes, no, they just happen to have found a gassed up Yerk ship ready to go and we're just gonna kind of take it. Like, whoops. <laughs> Big whoops. <Yay. laughs> and Cassie, like, starts getting into it. She's like, okay, I need to sort some stuff out, but I'm ready. And Jake goes, no, you're staying here. Marco's coming with me. And Cassie's like, oh, he agreed to go with you. And Jake's like, not yet, but he's going to. And Cassie feels this very confusing mix of emotions where she's like, I've been rejected, but I'm relieved I don't have to go, but I'm sad that I'm not going. And Jake, like, senses this or figures it out somehow, and he's like, you have a life and a job here. The hork surviving as part of our victory and you continuing to fight for them and doing this work to protect them, that's our victory. That's a part of this war and this fight as well. So your job is here, and that's what you're going to do. And Jake also reconciles in this moment that, like, this is a lifeline being thrown to me. I have nothing. This is something I can do. Like, I have to go. Mm-hmm. But you you belong here. Um, and when he had finished, she says, so is this you saying goodbye to me? And Jake goes, yeah, for now. But I also need you to tell me where Tobias is. And Cassie's like, no one knows where Tobias <laughs> is. And Jake's like, yeah, don't pull that crap with me. I know he hates me, but Axe is his friend and he would want to go. So, like, just tell me where to find him. And Cassie's like, he doesn't hate you. And Jake's like, just tell me where to go. <laughs> and finally, Cassie's like, okay, here's what you do. And a second later, she's watching as a peregrine flies away over the mountain. And she realizes that she's just said goodbye to Jake for the last time. Oh, no. Yeah. It just, it makes me think of... I, I forgot what book of hers it was, but she was like, I want out of this war and like, don't I deserve, to-? I think it was a skunk book. She was like, I like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And Jake's like, you've done more than enough, but we need you. And I feel like this mm-hmm. was kind of like your, your excuse basically. Like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> that's a really good connection. I did not make that connection. That's really, yeah. Cause she's like wanted to leave so many times and she's left the team before and Mm -hmm. like you know it's hard on all of them but jake knows it's like really really hard on her and because i think part of him still loves her he was like you have Mm -hmm. to stay here and carry on this great work that we've done like you're you're the legacy basically so that's like his last kind of gift to her sort of 
Yeah. But I... Oh, man. And that's, like... That's awesome on his part, too, to be like, you are the legacy. You are what we want to continue. Me, I'm the old guard, and I'm being thrown a lifeline. I have to go, but, like, you're the future of this. Yeah. Oh, I guess that is kind of all the culmination of them saying, like, what would the world be without the Cassies of the world? Mm-hmm. Like, she's the reason that we fight so that we can have a better future. The rest of us are obsolete once this war is over. Yeah. I don't remember what book that was in, but I believe we've read uh-huh. that. She's like she's always been like the heart and the hope of the team, and mm-hmm. and she gets to carry that on. And I do appreciate yeah. that she was ready to go, though. Oh yeah, that was it was just, it was a really good scene. I liked it a lot. Like she's always pulled her weight. She's never, you know, she's backed away from doing the wrong thing, but she's never backed away from doing the work. Yeah, <sighs> Cassie. I'm sorry. (laughs) We forgive you. I forgive you. Man, I don't even feel like I can forgive her. I feel like she needs to forgive me. I'm the fuck up here. She's the one that's clearly doing the right thing. Are you ready for this next one? I guess. This uh, is another gut punch chapter Uh right here. Aww. So Tobias is hunting in his meadow, his beautiful meadow with a stream and plentiful prey, except for last year during the drought where he almost died. But like now it's cool. (laughs) Him and droughts, man. (laughs) Him and droughts. He does not fucking do well. Um, And he's trying to hunt this meadow vole that had half a tail from an earlier encounter with him. And he basically decides to spare its life for today because he's just not in the fucking mood. And part of the reason he's not in the fucking mood is because even though he's away from the common areas to see hork and the hiking trails, somehow two campers had found his meadow and had stayed there the night before. And he is incredibly annoyed about this. <laughs> um, he had been watching them, of course, all night. And he had noticed when the female camper had played the flute. And he did get closer to listen because she did play with professional skill. But, like... He was pissed that they were there. He's also observing them and he goes, I don't know what it is about them because she didn't look like Rachel and he doesn't look anything like me. But maybe it was the way that they were so clearly in love Aww. that he thought it looked like the two of them. Like he always thought that this would be their future before. Rubbing their love died. in his face. Exactly. Um, and he's like thinking maybe that's why I'm so annoyed with them, blah, blah, blah. But then he's like, Well, you know, when you live on your own in the wild and you're a wild bird, you only have yourself to rely on. So I'm just going to say it. I fucking don't want them here. And so he's considering running them out of his meadow when this the woman starts pointing to something in the trees. And so he looks over and it's Toby and Tobias's mood instantly improves. He's like, oh, Toby's here. Great. And then he notices that there's a wolf coming along and that's very concerning to him. He does not like that. (laughs) He's like, "Okay, it must be Cassie. But when Toby gets closer and she starts saying like, hey, Tobias, I've done something that you may not approve of. Tobias is like, oh, no, like, should I be angry or should I be trusting? And then finally, he's just like, what is it? And that's when the wolf finally speaks up and it's Jake. And he's like, oh, shit. So Jake starts to demorph. The campers are snapping pictures of them. And Tobias is even more pissed. He's like, hey, Ken and Barbie, why don't you fucking knock it off over there with your bullshit? <laughs> Which is great. Um, and when Jake's fully demorphed, Tobias notes that he's grown out of looking like a boy and now looks like a young man, but with old men's eyes. Gross. And he's like, you look older. <laughs> it's super gross. <laughs> Tobias is like, you look older. And Jake's like, you do too. And Tobias is like, well, it was nice catching up. Bye bye Jake. And he goes to take off, but Jake says, it's about Axe. And Tobias is kind of on this precipice. He's like, I can fly away now and never worry about this, but... Axe is my shorm, my relative, my only family that I had for a while. And so finally he said, what about Axe? Cut chapter. So, in my favorite morphing sequence of the whole series, (laughs) Marco is morphing into a lobster beside his pool and, like, just enthralled with himself. He's like, 
I haven't done this morph since the day in the supermarket. And he's watching his like his like hands all meld together and then like get fat. And then he's like, oh, <laughs> like his skin no. turns all mottled. And he's like, oh. And then he's like, and then my doorbell rang. But my butler Weatherby would get it. His name is actually McPherson, but I want to call him Weatherby. So I will. <laughs> oh no! Wow, this boy has read too many Archie comics. That is for sure, because uh. that is where Weatherby is from. So he's like, whatever, Weatherby will send away whatever groupie was here. I am a millionaire after all with a TV show that took the X-Files time slot and is doing extremely well and a girlfriend and mansions and seven Maseratis. Oh and blah, blah. This boy. He basically just lists all the shit he has. Uh. Oh, he starts off with, let me see if I can find it real quick. He starts off with how much money he has in the bank. Nine million something. Nine million four hundred and thirty-two thousand wow. dollars. That's so much more money than I'll ever see. Yep. It's fine. God damn it, Mark. It's fine. God damn it. God damn it. Wee. So anyways, Marco is morphing a lobster. And when Jake walks in, Jake's like, what the fuck? And he's like, hey, Jake, remember this morph? And Jake's like, yeah, but why are you doing it now? And Marco's like, I dropped my keys in the pool. And Jake's like, oh, well, thank God you have a lobster morph. Most people would be totally helpless. Completely screwed. <laughs> Out of control. Ugh. Huh. It's true, though. But yeah, he basically he basically just shits on Marco for a Good. while. It's pretty great. And Marco's like, well, when has you all chipper? Did you finally get on Prozac? And Jake is like, oh, that's mean, though. How could you say this mean thing to me? So Marco's basically like, shitting on jake as well and then he throws himself down in a pool chair and then he notices that a hawk has been circling overhead and in a split second marco realizes what all of that means and he says in an instant his entire life felt like it was a movie set where they had turned up all the lights Mm -hmm. the walls went transparent for him and he could see weatherby and his coke coming towards him on a silver tray but he felt like the last three years was all an act and he's right back in the war Jake watches, knowing that Marco has realized that something's going on, and then Tobias swoops down onto the patio table while Jake recounts what happens to Axe. When he's finished, Jake says, are you coming? And Marco starts to go on a tangent about how, like, what, this is your redemption for yourself, you get a chance to play general again, and you're going to take it. And Jake is kind of hurt by this immediate reaction, and Marco feels guilty, which makes him angry at himself, and then angry at Jake because he's angry at himself. And Jake tries to, like, kind of explain it away, and Marco goes, no, 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 I'll go with you, but you have to listen to me now. That's the price you pay. You got us through that war, and you won it. But then you spent the past three years quarterbacking every decision you made. Every mistake you made, you went over a thousand times. And now you think you can go back into it and be perfect this time around? You aren't perfect. In fact, I am better at tactics than you. And this is where Tobias says, oh, Marco, you're so humble as well. And Marco's like, even Jake knows it. Just shut up. (laughs) And Marco kind of continues on telling Jake, like, you got us through that on instinct alone and you can't be crippled by not trusting your gut. You got them. You got us into so many bad situations and you got us out again because you didn't know any better than to trust your instincts. So if we're going out again, then that's the Jake that I want to go with. And Jake said, well, that's the Jake that got people killed. So do you want me to keep you alive or do you want to get killed like Rachel and Tom? And Marco says, oh, I'd very much like to live, but I know that the only way to do that is by following your instincts. And of course, Marco is in, but he did not get through to Jake, like at all. So, but he goes anyways. Hooray. We cut to them bumping along a desert road in a Humvee with Jake, Marco, and Tobias all crammed in the front seat of the Humvee that they are in. They were following GPS coordinates, and as they approach, Marco turns off the headlights so they don't look like complete amateurs. There is another Humvee following them with Mendorash and two recruits from the class that Jake was teaching. He had asked for volunteers for a dangerous and deadly mission that they probably wouldn't survive, they wouldn't be paid more, they'd have to disappear and leave their families, they would get no credit, no glory, and they would be the low men on the totem pole. All but three people in his class volunteered. And Jake took two of them because six people had worked for them before and he's like, why fuck up a good thing? So he had taken Santorelli and another recruit named uh, Jean Castain. And I think that's what they were trying to get at with that pronunciation in there where they had the Z-H-E-N-N. But how I would say it, if I were speaking French, 
And I mean, I only know Quebec French, but how I would say it is Jean. Jean. <laughs> Jean Castain. <laughs> they, uh, Jake picked both of them because of their lack of any close family. And of course he should have foreseen the issue with Marco. The issue being Jean was very beautiful, but he didn't because I don't know why. <laughs> So there's a big bump in the road, and Marco's like, see, see, you should have brought Joan here. She could have been up here with us. I could have protected her from the bruises of the road. And Jake is basically like, why are you such a fuck-ass, Marco? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, there's some more back and forth with Marco constantly complaining, and they have this moment where, like, Marco's like, I had to leave my life, my TV show. How will it go on without me? And Jake's like, so basically, if I had have done this mission and not invited you, you would have been pissed. And Marco's like, oh, yeah, for sure. And he's like, and there's no way that you would say no to this mission. Marco's like, oh, no way. I'm for sure in. And Jake's like, but that's not going to stop you from bitching this whole time about all the shit that you're losing out on. And Marco's like, oh, definitely not. I'm for sure going to complain. Oh, my God, Marco. (laughs) I loved it so much. And Tobias was just along for the ride at this point. He was like, okay. (laughs) these fucking <laughs> great so anyways they, they get to the spot where they were headed out to in the desert the gps tells them that they're there so they stop the cars they get out and uh the humvee following them do as well and jake starts briefing santorelli and jean she and he's like we're gonna go seize control of the andalite ship that's right out there um we have to overpower two andalites we have to knock them out steal the ship get into orbit basically this is part of the plan the andalites like on the ship don't really know but they have to make it look real and like they overpowered them and jean was the one that was like six on two that doesn't seem very fair that's overkill and menderash is like it's hardly enough these are andalites we're talking about (laughs) and like jake basically is like oh these fucking noobs he's like Guys, we'll do it with just two. Two on two. It'll be fair. And so then he orders Tobias to morph Andalite. And it was kind of a test for both himself and Tobias to see if Tobias would follow his orders and if he could do it. And um, Tobias doesn't say anything, but he starts morphing Andalite. A moment later, he calls out for help, and the Andalites in the ship come to, like, where they can look out and see. And... It just at the limits of their vision, they can catch an Andalite running through the desert, but it's so far away, it might be a wild horse. And so they both train all four eyes, straining to see where this distressed Andalite call is coming from when a gorilla drops down and just smashes their heads together, knocking them out. (laughs) So we get to them piloting away, and Menderash is basically like, fucking careless. Those fucking careless guys. I can't believe they were taken by that. That's insane. And Jake's kind of laughing. He's like, Andalites always think they're so cool. (laughs) But yeah, so they they get up into orbit above Earth and they start approaching the ship that is the one that they are going to steal. And it looks kind of menacing and like really sleek. It's kind of like a boomerang with the two wings facing forward with weapons arrays on each wings and the middle part is like swept forward in this really kind of like sleek look and jake says okay menderash take us in but menderash hesitates and jake's like oh god i was worried about this he doesn't want to take orders from me like what are we gonna do and so jake kind of challenges him and says is there a problem menderash and menderash kind of hesitates he goes well it's not a problem, but it is an Andalite custom to name a ship before boarding because our our history says that we can't the ship can't be known by the crew until the ship knows itself. And Jake responds kind of with his thing saying, "Well, customs on Earth says that a ship always has to be a she even if it's named after a man." And so they're all standing around in contemplation for a while until Tobias said, "She's beautiful. She's beautiful and dangerous and exciting." And Jake turns to look at Tobias, surprised, and Marco starts laughing. And thus, they looked upon their new home, the Rachel. Oh, (laughs) cute. It's so good. Let's get to it, I guess. So they flew out into space, taking four days of Z-Space to get to where they think the blade ship may have gone if it stayed on the same course. Everything was a big if at this point. Jake insists on cross-training, so Marco was learning how to fly the ship from Menderash, who, while normally pretty differential to Jake, is apparently a megalomaniac drill sergeant when it comes to teaching. (laughs) 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 So 
So they make it out to where they thought the blade ship might be, and they found nothing. They went back and found nothing. And Marco mentions that he tells Menderash to turn the ship around, and Menderash gets very pissed when he says things like that because backing up and turning around is not what you do in space. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but they continue to search, finding some interesting stuff, but no sign of the blade ship. And days turns into weeks, weeks turns into months. They search for any sign, but find nothing. And Marco's getting bored. He'd watched all the DVDs he brought with him too many times to count. So one day while he was playing Tomb Raider on the ship's computers, <laughs> he's interrupted by an orange squiggle on the nav. I know, he's such a teenage boy. <laughs> He called Menderash over and he says, it looks like this ship is hailing us. That's what those red numbers mean, right? And they broadcast themselves as the Starship Enterprise from the Federation. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, They think, for the most part, that this is just their own personal in-joke, which generally would mean nothing to anybody in this part of the galaxy. But, you know, shit's never quite as far flung as it seems. So now that the ship is hailing them and they've made contact, Jake appears on the bridge, hair flat, looking like he'd just woken up, probably because he had. Tobias, Santarelli, and Jean appeared soon after. The ship hailed them back requesting a video face-to-face meeting, and they quickly decide that Santarelli will be their face so that Margo, Jake, and Tobias won't be recognized. It's a distinctly human face that appears on the view screen, asking, All right, show me Captain Picard. Santorelli hesitates, and that's when Marco whispers, I've always been more of a Kirk man myself. Santorelli repeats the line as if he hadn't just been fed it, and the other captain laughed. He asked who they were, and Marco made a slashing motion to cut Santorelli off before he said something wrong, and Marco gives him a yerk designation to read off, and Santorelli repeats it to the captain, who responds with his own yerk designation. The yerk demands to know their mission, and Santorelli replied, well, what's your mission out here? And the Yerk says, it's classified. And Santorelli's like, well, so is mine. So here we are. They face off for a while, kind of spinning closer to each other until Jake instructs, one of us has to blink first. Like, it's going to be us. So Santorelli said, the Empire was done. Through Jake's command, Santorelli tells him, the Empire was done. They're out here trying to figure out what to do. And that's when the Yerk tells him, subscribe to the one. And everybody's like, what the fuck is the one? What are you talking about? And the Yerk's like, oh, I can show you. And then in this weird, crazy glitch, his face kind of like splits and falls apart. And like, there's a bright light and like shit's shifting. They have no clue what's happening. And then suddenly there's an Andalite face on the view screen in front of them. A familiar face, but split heinously by a gaping red mouth lined with teeth. Tobias is the one that says, Axe? The one laughs and demands Jake the Yerk Killer step out. He said, I can feel your mind. I know you're there. So Jake steps out without hesitation. The one says, you've done well to come this far, but now you would be taken like Axe was. Prepare to be assimilated, basically. Oh, God. Jake doesn't respond to the one. He instead says to Menderash, can we fire? And Menderash says, we could, but the one ship has a lot more power. Their shields are stronger, and I doubt we could penetrate them. And Jake goes, okay, I thought so. But we're faster, right? And Menderash says, yeah, we're faster. So Jake turns and looks at all of them one at a time. And he goes, so what was it, Marco? Crazy, reckless, ruthless decisions? Marco nods, wishing he had kept his mouth shut. And then Jake gives the order, full emergency power to the engines. Ram the blade ship. That's how the series ends. What the fuck? (laughs) What? the hell what what um tell me about your initial reactions and then i'll go ahead and read the letter it was a lot of i i was confused like i started getting confused so really i was looking at the page count in my document so Mm -hmm. like you know the menderash and the other guy come and tell jake and then they're like they spend like seven chapters like preparing to go on this mission and then by the time they were like in space for months i looked at the page count and it was like 80 out of 85 and i'm like how can this possibly resolve in four more pages like what is happening (laughs) (laughs) and it's it's such a weird it was such a weird way to end a series. Like, you know, normally, like, with TV shows or something, like, they have an epilogue, and sometimes it's, like, half an episode. But everything is, like, nicely tied together in the end. 
And this one, like, you know, two thirds of the way through, everything was nicely tied together. And then, like, suddenly it felt like there was this whole other book at the end. And I was just, I didn't know how to feel about it. Well, let's read the, the letter. Because I'm not going to explain Applegate to anybody. I'll let her explain herself. <laughs> explain yourself. <laughs> explain yourself. So, this is chapter is titled, A Letter to the Fans. I know, I know. It's rotten to me to leave you hanging at the end like that. But I figured the Animorphs should go out the same way they came in. Fighting. Well, here it is at long last. The final chapter in the Animorph story. It began in the summer of 1996. It ends in the summer of 2001. Five years, 54 regular titles, four chronicles, five megamorphs, and two alternomorphs. An amazing number of you have read all those books. I am deeply grateful. I had a lot of fun writing these characters. I know it sounds pretentious to say that I'll miss them, but I will. It seems strange to think that I won't ever again write, My name is... It makes me a little sad to say goodbye to the Andalites, Horkbizur, Chi, Taxon, and even Yerks. It was fun sitting down every day at my computer to invent that strange universe. There are a bunch of people to thank. Hey, what is this, an Academy Awards speech? First of all, Scholastic, in particular, Jean Fywell, Tanya Alicia Martin, and Craig Walker. Also the talented folks who created such great art for the series. And, of course, the people who never got mentioned, but who are responsible for the crucial step from publisher to bookstore. Blah, blah, blah. Um, sorry, I'm skipping over that. Because we have this letter and then we have another one, so we're going to go through both. Um, bookstore, blah, 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 publisher to bookstore, sales marketing force. Mostly I want to thank you guys, the readers. You praised, you complained, you extolled, you demanded, you asked questions that sometimes I couldn't answer. You told your friends, you started websites, you sent letters and emails, you wrote fan fiction, you pointed out every error I made. <laughs> <laughs> you were thoughtful. <laughs> you were sorry. <laughs> You were thoughtful and critical and imaginative. You were loyal. I want you all to know that it is my choice to end Animorphs. Much as I'll miss it, the time had come. Time to say goodbye, Jake. Goodbye, Cassie. You too, Tobias, Marco, and Axe. Goodbye, Rachel. And now would be the time for me to say goodbye to you. But I'm off to a new series called Remnants, and I'm hoping I'll see you over there in that uni new universe. If not, thanks in the bottom of my heart for everything. If you're coming along on the next trip, grab onto something. So we're going to start off by blowing up the entire world. Then real trouble will start. You may now demorph. Oh. So that's the letter to the fans. But us fans are assholes and kept saying, but wait, what the fuck, <laughs> Applegate? Because <laughs> we're dicks. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Let me find the letter. And I'm just looking in our chat history because I... Oh, no, you're going to you. read the letter on the black background with the hot green text. Yeah, I'm used to it. It's oh no my problem. Oh, well. no. <laughs> I had to, like, copy and paste it into a Word document. I was like, I don't want my eyes to explode. Oh, my eyes will explode. I'm doing this for all of you. <laughs> so, basically, even though we got that wonderful letter from Applegate saying like they went out the way they came in fighting and we should have been happy with that. Instead, we all got pissed. We all kept abusing this wonderful <laughs> woman who's so very kind and her husband who's, you know, very, it's just a genius. And we took them and abused them to their faces. So instead she had to write this letter to calm us the fuck down. And it goes a little something <laughs> like this. Dear Animorphs readers, quite a number of people seem to be annoyed by the final chapter in the Animorphs story. There are a lot of complaints that I let Rachel die, that I let Visor 3 slash 1 live, that Cassie and Jake broke up, that Tobias seems to have been reduced to unexpressed grief, that there was no grand final fight to end all fights, that there was no happy celebration, and everyone is mad about the cliffhanger ending. So I thought I'd respond. Animorphs was always a war story. Wars don't end happily, not ever. Often relationships that were central during war dissolve during peace. Some people who are brave and fearless in war are unable to handle peace, feel disconnected and confused. Other times, people in war make the move to peace very easily. Always people die in wars, and always people are left shattered by the loss of loved ones. That's what happens, so that's what I wrote. Jake and Cassie were in love during the war and ended up going their separate ways afterwards. Jake, who is so brave and capable during the war, is adrift during peace. Marco and Axe, on the other hand, move easily past the war and even manage to use their experience to good effect. Rachel dies and Tobias will never get over it. That doesn't by any means cover everything that happens in a war, but it's a start. Here's what doesn't happen in war. 
There are no wondrous climactic battles that leave the good guys standing tall and the bad guys lying in the dirt. Life isn't a World Wrestling Federation smackdown. Even the people who win a war, who survive and come out on the other side with the conviction that they have done something brave and necessary, don't do a lot of celebrating. There is very little chanting of war number one among people who've personally experienced war. I'm just a writer, and my main goal was always to entertain. But I've never let Animorphs turn into just another painless video game version of war, and I wasn't going to do it at the end. I've spent 60 books telling a strange, fanciful war story, sometimes very seriously, sometimes more tongue-in-cheek. I've written a lot of action and a lot of humor and a lot of sheer nonsense. But I've also, again and again, challenged readers to think about what they were reading, to think about the right and the wrong, not just the who beat who. And to tell you the truth, I'm a little shocked that so many readers seem to believe I'd wrap it all up with a lot of high-fiving and backslapping. Wars very often end, sad to say, just as ours did, with a nearly seamless transition to another war. So you don't like the way our little fictional war came out? You don't like Rachel Dead and Tobias Shattered and Jake Guiltwritten? You don't like that one war simply led to another? Fine. Pretty soon you'll all be of voting age and of draft age. So when someone proposes a war, remember that even the most necessary wars, even the rare wars where the lines of good and evil are clear and clean, end with a lot of people dead, a lot of people crippled, and a lot of orphans, widows, and grieving parents. If you're mad at me because that's what you have to take away from Animorphs, too bad. I couldn't have written it any other way and remain true to the respect I've always felt for the Animorphs readers. <laughs> So you guys, we were such dicks. She felt the need to write that. Way to fucking go. <laughs> so mad. I'm sure she wasn't as mad as I made it sound. Uh. But I mean, okay. This, I am definitely one of the people that, especially after reading that letter, it was like, thank you for having the fucking respect for me. <laughs> to, yeah. Like, write that instead of the fanciful ending because that's that's true that's how shit goes it's not good and it's not happy it's not wonderful Mm -hmm. and um i i learned that standing in a borders bookstore when i was much younger than this and since then the world has gone to shit several times over and you know what i was prepared it'll continue to go to shit (laughs) like i loved everything like i loved that like Jake and Cassie didn't get together, and I love that Marco was happy, mm-hmm. and I loved that, you know, Tobias was ruined. Like, I totally bought all of that. And it's like, yeah. she's absolutely right. Like, war does not end with everybody super happy. Like, everybody deals with it in their own way. And the way that each character dealt with the war was so authentic and true to themselves. And it was it was gold. I... I don't know about the whole, like, last third of the book. I liked that... I liked Jake's transformation into realizing that he had another mission. You know, mm-hmm. like, he... That he felt like it was a lifeline for him, and that, like, he started to, like, change before the other character's very eyes. He started to get that fire back. But I don't know. I I, I don't... Like, not to criticize Applegate or anything, because I like the fact that... She was basically like, one war led seamlessly into another war. Like, that is absolutely mm-hmm. true to me. Like, that speaks to real life. Like, even if something resolves, something else pops up. And, like, we're... I feel like we're always going to be fighting each other. I, I kind of wish it had been shortened, almost. Like, I I thought there was... Maybe a little too much, like, build up to a thing. I don't know. Like, maybe... uh... But I don't know how I would have done it. I I don't know what I'm trying to say. No, I I know what you mean. And... Do you want me to tell you why I liked it? Because I think our our feelings are very, very similar. So, I, I agree. I liked it all up into the point where... They encounter the one, almost because it seemed like the one became, especially because of all the imagery for me that associated that, like, gaping mouth with, like, the imagery of the Black Gate and the mouth of Sauron at the Black Gate, which means it feels like we're leading right before the charge of, like, Gondor and Rohan to save Frodo. So, like, 
it's very cliffhangery, and especially if you read those stories or know those stories, it transitions here. But here's why I absolutely fucking loved it. And it all comes down to Jake. Because Jake's decision at the end of the war to flush the pool ship was a decision that Alfanger refused to make, that he refused to make until he had gone too far. Mm -hmm. But ram the blade ship was exactly what Alfanger did when he made the right move with the Elemist. And I loved the bookend of Jake making the right decision at the end, based entirely on what Alfanger did. I loved those echoes throughout the book and that's why i loved that he rammed the blade ship and i even though it was a little like ham-handed to get the blade ship there i loved that those were the final words oh okay that's cool (laughs) yeah that's that's what i really enjoyed okay i guess i forgot about that part oh yeah, well, it's because it's such a small detail, right? Because that's when Elfangor ends the, or like kind of saves the the Andalites after he gets transitioned back from Earth. So uh, anyways, that's like, those are the kind of echoes that I really appreciate. Oh, and like it took a few read-throughs to oh, get it. Oh, 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 that's awesome. Right? That's awesome. Okay. Uh, and it it makes it better, even though I agree with you that I don't, love the character of the one just because of how mythical he feels like i want a more like visor three never felt visor three visor one never felt mythical to me and the one feels like i am a superpower being and it's like we're not fighting cryak again okay that's the other thing that i think left me wanting is nothing with cryak and the elemist was resolved like you know the elemist appeared to rachel and, like, we knew that was going to happen because of what happened in the Elemis Chronicles. But, and, like, we can assume, I guess we can assume that Cryak and the Elemis just kind of were like, all right, well, they, they won the war, so I guess we're going to go fuck off to whatever other thing we're going to do. Right. The Elemis won this one, so I guess we're going to go play the game. Yeah. Else. But just the fact that they were so prominent throughout the series and this was all, like, their design And the fact that they didn't get, like, Mm -hmm. a final word in was kind of weird to me. That, you know, that is... Now, see, I can't decide if I like that or not. Because I do like the idea, especially since we... Nobody but Rachel gets a final word. Everybody else has an end where they just go and it's not acknowledged. It's not a big moment. They just quietly die and move on to nothing. And I kind of like... That just like the auxiliary animorphs, just like Double Days people, just like, you know, everybody else who died except Rachel, they too never got the final word. They just kind of disappeared and their story ended. But um, that would have been really great to have a cap on that story somehow that just said, like, you know, the Elemist, because he won, like, this one thing. The, like anything, any any sort of apparition, anything to Jake, like any sort of signal that like we could read into it one or even like, OK, but like, you know, we're headed towards like this like red thing and the red light blink yeah. or something yeah. like that. Like that. See, that would have been cool. Like on maybe one of the ships, like all of the red lights just blinked out at the yeah. same time once Rachel died and the war was. Won. Yeah, like, something like that would have been cool. Like some some sort of of q like i don't know yeah some yeah some some sign that of the elemist cryak fight that the elemist had won that yeah i feel like if the elemist had manifested himself to jake and been like good job man you're on the war i think it would have come off as really cliche yeah and cheesy Um, but yeah i think but i i also think that like just doing nothing for that was yeah, I don't know. Like, I could see it. I can I can justify it. But, like, it would have been cool to have some sort yeah. of signal. I also <laughs> wish that there had been some mention of, like, a memorial or something to go up for Double Days people and James and the other Animorphs. Because, like, just something to, like, honor them, I guess. Yeah, like, because even, you know, they're talking about the Forgotten Animorphs. Well, what about all of the auxiliary yeah. Animorphs? And, like, why isn't there something for them like i I don't know a children's hospital anything like so much shit yeah just like and it wouldn't it would have taken less than one line to just like mention them somewhere in the epilogue 
or not the epilogue, but the same amount of time it took to just like write about the hork Valley that suddenly moved for no yeah. reason, or for for a reason. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, just the fact that they like died this horrific death and then were never mentioned again. Basically, it was kind of like rubbed me the wrong way a little bit. No, that's yeah for sure. And I I mean I know that it was like. They were we were so hyper focused on like the negotiations and like Rachel and like what happened to our core team, but it would have been nice to have mention of those guys or like even like Jake talking to James's mom or something like like anything. Yeah, just just because we spent a whole book with them and we got to know them and you know they they were our friends and they you know mm-hmm. like other obviously other people died for this war, like, Doubleday lost some people, and, you know, there are other kind of, like, nameless face people that died, but we don't know them. And it's not to say they shouldn't be honored. We had a personal relationship with James and the Auxiliary Animorphs, and I don't know. Mm -hmm. Don't forget them. Don't you forget about them. Yeah, no, it's absolutely true, especially since they all got unremarkable deaths where they were there and then they were gone. Like, there was no fight, there was no glory, yeah. there was nothing. They just got shot down where yep. they stood. God. I just want to know if my son is okay. Probably not. <laughs> he's probably... <laughs> uh, he's like a Borg Andalite now. I was going to say the Nazgul. The Nazgul <gasps> Borg. Oh. Yep. He flew too close to we the sun. We chose the characters who died or presumably died. Yeah. Fucking polar bears, man. Fuck that guy. Um, yeah. What do we do? I don't do we know. rate books? Do we rate characters? Like, what I do we do? I don't even know. Oh, I don't, I don't <laughs> know how to move forward from this. Me either. Like, I know this isn't our last episode, because obviously we're going to record podcasts until we're old, but like... Yeah, but, but I, I don't know how to end this. <laughs> I don't know either. Like, what if we go through our character ratings, but instead of giving them ratings, we just kind of talk about what we love about them? Yes. Okay. Is that a good way? Is that a good sure. way to end this? <laughs> it's like, it's like those videos they show of like in memoriams where. In memoriam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just have like video clips of the character. Can't. Okay, let's give our in memoriam tributes to our oh, characters. Shit. Let's just go ahead and assume that they all died except Cassie and give our in memoriam <laughs> tributes. They're all dead inside. To our characters. Let's go in order. What's your in memoriam for Jake? Oh, Jake. So, haven't we talked before about like how Jake is going to do after the war was over i feel like we have i just i think it's so interesting how um that scene with him and cassie um and he was like we should get married and you know maybe i'll go to school and blah 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 and none of that happened Mm -hmm. and it's just so sad i wonder i wonder if that would have happened if he hadn't you know flushed all those yurks and gotten Rachel and Tom killed. Yeah, I feel like we could pin it strictly on the flushing the yurks because that was like he just held it that he was a monster <laughs> and like telling Rachel to kill Tom that would have weighed heavily on him for sure, but I feel like you know, he wasn't directly responsible for that death. I think it was the combination that destroyed him. <laughs> so Maybe, but the other thing is, is, like, it was totally his own depression and his own mental state that kept him from reaching out to Cassie, because all he had to do to continue that relationship was to reach out, and he didn't. And, like, not to say all he had to do, because clearly he was going through some mental shit and PTSD, and, like, you know, it's an insurmountable task for him in this time, but... It's interesting how it all fell apart, and it feels like it was so close to being, like, you can recover Mm -hmm. from this. And then he just didn't. Do you think Cassie could reach out to him, though? But do you think it would be, like, a lost cause? I mean, I think Cassie could have reached out to him, but you can't have a one-sided relationship. Like, it could only be that way for so long, Mm -hmm. right? Well, and, like, part of that is, 
you know, on the beach when Marco was like, you may have thought these awful things when you flushed those yurks, but, you know, you were acting in self-defense and Cassie didn't say anything. So it's like, maybe Cassie can't reconcile what he did. And so that prevented yeah, her from and reaching like, out. And, right. And immediately after, I think she did, like when she was talking to Eric, she immediately jumped to Jake's defense. But I think the longer she sat with it, the more she realized, like, that wasn't right. That wasn't okay, what yeah. you did. And I get, uh, I have to think back to that book, um, you know, it was several weeks ago, but like the Yerks in the pool were defenseless in that moment. So like, was flushing them and basically demoralizing Visor 1 into submis- into submission, was that the victory or could they have gotten him to submit if they hadn't flushed the Yerks? I think it was totally out of anger. I think they could have won without flushing the Yerk pool. And I think that that was just because we've seen that decision being made three or four times throughout the series. It was totally to show this is how far Jake has gone. And especially when Marco gets in his face and says, like, you were happy about it. You were high. Mm -hmm. You were like, you thought, I want you to suffer. I want you to feel what I felt. It was a total revenge killing. It had nothing to do with the victory at all. Yeah. I'm thinking about the um, the atomic bombs in World War II. To, to some people, like, that was the yeah. thing that ended the war. This, like, horrific devastation. But, I don't know. Maybe it's not fair to draw comparisons <laughs> to a horrific real-life event. Versus, like, a... I mean, I think it is. I think it's it's totally fair because that's where this material was taken yeah. from. So I think that's a very fair comparison. Yeah. But like, I don't know enough about World War II to know like what the the track was going towards if they hadn't dropped the two bombs. But I, yeah, I wonder if they could have won without flushing all those jerks. And kind of sounds like they could. I think they absolutely could have. I think they had them, and this was just a kick them while mm-hmm. they're down scenario. We um are we emotionally ready to talk about Rachel? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't I don't know what else to say that we haven't already talked about in the beginning. Like we never find out what happened to her dad. He's probably fine. <laughs> <laughs> he continued to be a newsman, weatherman. Oh my god, so I just started reading this book that Michael Grant wrote called uh, Front Lines. That's about what if women had been able to go into World War II Hmm. and like fight alongside the men. And one of his main characters had an older sister that was killed in the war that was named Rachel. And he pulls a direct Marco quote in there where he is talking about like, life is like, you know, a tragedy or a comedy. You have to... Like, reading it, I'm basically like, oh my god, am I just reading, like, Rachel's little sister's story? Oh my god! It's it's been really fucking with my head these past few weeks. I'm not done with it yet. I'm, like, halfway through the book. And it's just been really fucking with my head when I'm reading it. Because I'm like, I've created this whole narrative now about, like, what did Rachel's younger sisters (laughs) do? And, like, did one join the military to, like, follow in her dead sister's footsteps? And, like, you know, her journey? and. Um, One of the big themes is, like, the girl keeps asking, am I a coward? Like, she doesn't want to go to war to be a coward. And, like, just growing up, like, in her sister who is so brave in her shadow. And, like, I would love to see a similar narrative for Rachel's family about, like, her younger sisters being, like, she's such a war hero. And because she died, she's so much bigger than she ever would have been had she lived. And, like, how do I live up to that? Oh, I bet that is, like, a... Or, like, maybe he, when he was making characters, he was, like, heavily adopting either Jordan or Sarah into this new character or something. Or maybe it's just a one-off kind of, like, (laughs) Animorphs Easter egg. Yeah, comment. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Hey, my other readers will like this. (laughs) I, like, legit, though, I was reading it. And, I like, I read usually, like, really late at night. I go to bed after Scott. So, like, I'm, like, just talking to myself, like, in the dark, like, reading on my phone on, like, my Kindle. And I'm going, oh! (laughs) Oh, <laughs> that's Rachel's her older sister. Oh, oh my like, God. <laughs> it's so stupid. Direct pull. I'm so stupid. I should not do this. But yeah, it's like it really makes me want that story about like what 
Like, because we get the Animorphs' perspective about who did she leave behind, but they all have their own deep shit, and I want them more into what did she directly leave behind. And we only ever get that one chapter from Tobias where he's like, like, after Rachel dies, we see him one more time in his own yeah. perspective, and I want more. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So Tobias kind of became... I don't know if it's a stereotype, but, like, the sort of, like, hermit war veteran who, like, hates everybody and, like, just wants to be left alone, kind of. For sure. And so I'm going to bring up a different conversation that I had with uh, Jeff, our historian buddy, that messages us when we <laughs> And we were talking... <laughs> We were talking a few weeks ago about Rachel and Tobias and like something that I had said on uh, the podcast where Tobias gets his mom back was that he always demorphs for or always morphs to himself for his mom, but he doesn't do it for Rachel. And Jeff brought up like, is that because he loves Rachel loves him more than he loves her? Like she's willing to make changes for him and do stuff for him and he's not willing to sacrifice anything for her or to like compromise on anything for <laughs> her. And so the whole time I was reading it, I was reading like this ending of Tobias mourning and never reconciling that with, but did she love him more than he loved her? And was this the moment where he realized how much he had lost and how much she loved her? And that's part of why his mourning went on for so long. and was so intense because he never, really knew how much that he loved her and relied on her until she was gone and he had to deal with all of this on his mm -hmm. own. So that was something that I kept contemplating. And of course, we'll never know because all we got was that single chapter where he was just so conflicted between hating people that were bother bothering him, like you said, like the old war vet that hates everybody, and then Jake, the person that he, you know he sees and he thinks he's going to hate him and then he doesn't hate him as much as he thinks he does and what does that mean well we don't know because he's immediately thrown into this hole we have to go get yeah. axe thing like there was so many emotions and psychoses to explore mm -hmm. in that moment that i think we never got to and i would like to i um one of my predictions so. um you know i predicted that like losing rachel was gonna like destroy him but i kind of wondered if he was mm -hmm. gonna maybe start like keep up a relationship with his mom it sounds like he didn't but like yeah it sounds like he just left yeah which is really depressing yeah like you know he, he had just gotten his mom back and like at some point marco says like rachel was tobias's only only connection to his humanity or something and i was like well that's not really mm -hmm. true anymore like tobias has his mom back and that was such a big deal like a few books ago and yeah and he finds out that like he's related to axe and that's a big deal too like yeah and uh, another thing i thought was like is he gonna become a nothlet and you know go back to to human state like i think if rachel had lived i think he might have considered that but um yeah i don't know I don't know. I don't know. I'm very sad, though. Like, yeah, me too. I think it makes sense his ending that he's just an old man hawk living in his old man hawk meadow, and like that—that yeah. that all makes sense to me. I just, I, uh, I just feel so bad for him. Yeah, I agree. Though it all makes sense. It's just really depressing that that's he what happened. Yeah, like he had all these like new budding relationships coming up and he was starting to be this like new person because of it and then it just ended and it's so sad <laughs> it is so sad and like i think it was really important that when it's easy to say like oh he's completely shut in on himself and he's like only concerned about himself and blah 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 but like he really does just want to be left alone because i think if he only cared about himself and he was only like you know thinking about himself that when he showed up to the funeral he wouldn't have had those moments with naomi and cassie and like asking that permission like you know can't can i take rachel with me and like that final that final flight as you pointed <laughs> out so fucking depressing <laughs> <laughs> 
But like, oh my God, like something about that just, I think, speaks volumes to how sensitive he still is, really. Mm-hmm. Even though he tries to be the big, tough, wild raptor, he's still just that, like, little boy that, like, wants to, wants people to love him in his own way. He just refuses to accept it now. His race car bed. (laughs) His little race car bed. His little kiss on the forehead. Yeah, well, and it's it's interesting because it was implied that, like, he and Cassie kind of were talking to each other kind of towards the end there. Yeah. So I wonder how, like, that came about. Yeah. And I mean, I wonder if it was just the two of them, like, oh, Cassie's the one that, like... Because that could, like, play into that whole backstory of, like, how we've always speculated that they've had conversations Mm -hmm. about, like, morality and, like, the skunk kits and all that kind of stuff. And they've always kind of connected more behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they would kind of fall back onto that now would be really interesting. Um, But I also think it's just the fact that that was Cassie's best friend and Rachel's you know that was his girlfriend so like it makes sense that they would at some point cross paths to have that kind of like reconnection over remembering her yeah um and i i think it was implied that um tobias lives in yellowstone with the hork now it's i mean toby was there but like i don't know if toby's still yeah like at the old stomping grounds or like because it mentioned something about like toby being part of a non- voting member of congress or something like that so like they would have to be by some capital of something right (laughs) who knows side note when when that was brought up actually um that toby was a non-voter like it kind of opened a door in my mind to like alien politics it's like well like the hork obviously live on earth and they're planning on staying there so it's like are they gonna fight for like equal rights or like do (laughs) they not care very much because most of them aren't that intelligent or like i uh, (sighs) yeah i mean that's a good point especially because they're given land in yellowstone and oh sorry i just thought of another horrific implication of like (laughs) Here's what we're gonna do for Hork Bajur, but like native peoples that lived in the US I, we can I was go have a th- landfill think, somewhere. Yeah, I was thinking along those Ugh. same lines and I'm oh. God. Oh, no. That's horrifying. Oh no. Yeah, it's like there's fucking people fighting for you know, basic human rights nowadays and like what does that mean now? <laughs> in this alternative universe where Hork Bajir are here and oh my god, I hate it. Yeah. Like we haven't oh, we man. haven't fixed humanity yet. Like what's <laughs> I don't know. God damn. It. I don't know. <laughs> well, I guess we kinda did our in memoriam for Tobias, so I guess we move to Cassie next. Mm-hmm. I loved like her entire like outcome. Like it just it made so much sense mm-hmm. to me. And like my prediction was that she was gonna like pour everything she had into like making the world better and, like, trying to make up for the evils that she helped commit. Um, And, like, just trying to be this, like, good, amazing person. And it sounds like that's that's what happened. And I'm very proud of her. Yeah. I mean, I think she was, like, the one true survivor of the war. And in no small part to the fact that she always checked in with her humanity and she Mm -hmm. always made sure, like... She was the one saying, like, what, in book 19, that at the end of all this, we're going to have to answer to ourselves. And can you do that, like, with the atrocities you've committed? And she always stayed true to herself and made sure she could. Yeah. I've definitely come to appreciate and admire that much more on this read-through than any other other that I've yeah. done. <laughs> so your, your opinion of Cassie has shifted? It has. It really has. I mean... Rachel's my favorite and always will be. That will never change, yeah. no matter how old I yeah. get. That will never change. But every time, like, the older I get, the more I can appreciate Cassie's perspective. And especially now, like, actually talking it out with somebody and, like, really, like, picking apart what her actions meant. I think it's, she's the person that we should strive to be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she's the best role model. And I'm not, 
<laughs> yeah, she's the best role model, and I'm not there. And maybe that's why I didn't get it because, like, I'm not as nice as her. I'm not as good as her. I will not make those moral decisions like she will. I come from a very different place, and that's probably like I didn't understand what why she was doing some of the things she did that I considered bad, like getting rid of the cube and stopping Jake from stopping Tom because I come from a place of like victory at all costs right. and she comes from a different place and so I don't know it's just very different but I I appreciate her a lot more and I think it makes sense that she's the I feel like the one true survivor of this mm-hmm. war because even Marco like he jumps right back into it at the drop of a hat right yeah so. that's interesting to me yeah I I wonder if I don't know if we're just gonna like segue into Marco yet or whatever. Yeah, let's do it. Um, we're we're here. Yeah, I kind of wonder if like he was happy on some level, but I also kind of feel like he was just kind of like filling a void with all of this like stuff and money and and babes and shit. Like mm-hmm. because like yeah, like he was not super excited to give that up when Jake and Tobias came to him, but he. I, he he gave it up a lot more quickly than he accepted really being an animorph in the beginning of the series. Like he's always yeah. been the one that's like most tied to normal human video games and food and TV and stuff, and that that mm-hmm. echoed in his in his final days. But like, I yeah, <laughs> I don't know if it was like, oh, of course, like Axe is my friend. And uh, of course I'm going to go try and save him or like Jake is my best friend and I'll follow him anywhere or anything like that. But like, I don't know. I want to know his motivations, like his, his prime motivations. Like obviously he had several going on, but. If I can just write my own fan fiction over Marco's ending, (laughs) it would be that like he got (laughs) everything he ever wanted, but Unlike the end of Willy Wonka, where the moral is, do you know what happened to the guy who got everything he ever wanted? He lived happily ever after. Marco realized that everything he ever wanted was just a distraction, and it meant nothing compared to getting out there and fighting for his friends and doing good. And, like, he's a jokester, and he comes across as shallow, and he says problematic things, but at the end of the day, his heart is in the right place, Mm -hmm. and he's still going to do whatever it takes for his friends and fight for his friends because that's what really means something to him. Yeah. And I mean, in the end, too, like, oh, my God, he doesn't mention his mom at all. What does Ava do? She was Visitor 1 for a while. Like, what happens to her? Is she in the trial at all? Probably. Like, what happens to his dad? Like, what happens to the two of them? What happens? Does Nora Oh, yeah, what happened to Nora? Like, no, we don't know. Like, there's so much to Marco's backstory that, like, he just doesn't talk about because it's all about, I'm worried about Jake. I'm concerned about Jake. Like, you know, there's a lot (laughs) that we could really interrogate there. Yep. Yep. I don't know. And, like, I was just going to say, like, maybe that's... I, I, I kind of am leaning towards that's the main reason why he decided to go with with Jake like maybe because he recognized that Jake was kind of coming back in a weird way and he wanted to like be with him and like bear witness to that I don't know maybe it was just like a crushing sense of responsibility for Jake like he can't do this without me like I am his right hand man I am his planner he needs me like and I'm not gonna leave but okay so the line that like really got me was when Marco said, like, yeah, like, I'll go for Axe and I'll go for you. And then he makes some comment about Tobias, like, and this flea bit and buzzard here, I guess I can stand him. And it's like, <laughs> I really wonder how much of that was, like, you and Axe mean a lot to me. And, like, Tobias is my teammate, but, like, you and Axe, I have to do this for yeah. you guys. I don't know. I don't, because he, I think, could have just as easily said you guys need me here, like, on Earth to continue, like, keeping the Animorphs, like, on the up and coming and in the the public eye and in the media, like, you know? 
but the fact that he would drop it is interesting. Yeah. You know, kind of like um, Cassie's perspective of, like, he's, you know, in the beginning he was like, I don't want to fight in this war, or I'm just going to do this last mission and I'm done. Haven't I done my time? Mm-hmm. So, like, he could have come at it from that angle, too, and just been like, the war's over. I'm, I'm done, man. I want to enjoy my life. Yeah, but, like, when they came upon him and found him, he was morphing a lobster in his pool. Like, yeah. it's... I think the signs are there that his life is very shallow and meaningless to him. And this is like, oh, yeah, that's way more. Like, I want to do that. Yeah. Well, and even Axe was like, I have the best job in the in the fleet and I'm still bored. Because he's probably like, he's yeah. been through the most exciting, you know, adventures. And they weren't all great, but they were, you can't deny they were exciting. And now, comparatively, he's, it makes sense that he's bored. The other thing about Axe in particular, too, is, like, every time he's talking about his experience on the ship, it's like, Menderash doesn't approve because it's not Andalite enough. And I've got to think that he's not connecting with any of his crew in the same way he connected with the Animorphs. And it's those bonds that make these fights meaningful Mm -hmm. it's not the fights themselves it's not just the excitement like yeah sure that's a part of it but it's who you're fighting for this is his friends yeah and like maybe there's signs he was super close to menderash but even so it's Mm -hmm. like it's not like fighting with the animorphs when it was the six of them versus the galaxy that's a good point there's not that bond and that camaraderie and you know, mm-hmm. he he was already having so many, like, identity crises about, like, humans versus Andalites. And now that he's back with the Andalites, that has to be weird after spending so much time with humans. Yeah. And Yeah, and I think even in that short chapter, it's very apparent that he's weird to the Andalites now. Like, oh, he should act like this, but he acts like... Like, yeah. he's weird. <laughs> yeah. Like, y- you were always saying that, like... Elfangor and Axe were kind of like weirdly like the black sheep of of the Andalite worlds because Mm -hmm. they had like this extra element of like compassion and humanity to them. Yeah. So I mean Elfangor is obviously like still very revered in in Andalite culture and as is Axe now but like I kind of wonder if there's just this kind of like mindset with the others of like, oh yeah, they're really awesome, but man, they're kind of just like weird dudes, man, because they've been living with humans for too long. Yeah. Or like, yeah. maybe that's not a big deal since Andalites are visiting Earth a lot more. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think it, God, it totally depends. Like, interacting with normal citizens, it's got to feel like weird because they're like, oh, these are revered military Andalites, but interacting with their military peers, they definitely do not fit in, Mm -hmm. and yet oh my god, I mean, I still think they're the black sheep, but, like, maybe in a positive way, like, in a way that you have to revere somebody that's done so much good that it seems impossible. (laughs) Yeah. I'm very happy that Axe didn't, like, track down Estrid and, like, marry her or some bullshit like that. I was kind of waiting for that to happen. Like, I know he was basically like, (sighs) bitch, bye, um, because she sucks, and he, like, made it known that, like, she sucks and he doesn't like her, but, like, yeah, I don't know. (laughs) Uh, Oh my god, that would have been I would have been so mad (laughs) if he had married Estrid. Although we don't really know if she's even alive anymore, so. Right. Maybe they are married and we just didn't find out uh, about it. He has 16 Andalite uh, children. They're all uh, smart and terrible. No, it kind of sounds like they all, like, went off and did their own thing alone. Yeah. Except for Cassie, who's dating Ronnie. And Marco has, like, a very vapid girlfriend. Like, I wouldn't count that as a serious relationship at all. God, I feel like I haven't said enough about Rachel. Like, I feel like that's the true in memoriam that I should have really <laughs> latched on to, and I didn't. Oh, no. I mean, we gave... I, I don't know. We talked... I just feel like we talked about her so I much at the know. beginning, and not to, like... We did. And yet, like, we didn't talk about yeah, her at all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I don't want to hammer that home. I just... I feel like... 
it's I don't know. It feels like that should be the in memoriam, even though we have to say goodbye to all of them. It's like Rachel was the one that like really it was the most clear cut death, the most classic death. (laughs) Do you think that she would have been considered a bigger war criminal than a hero if she hadn't have died at the end there? Like, do you think she was saved entirely by her own death? Hmm. Interesting. I don't know. I have no answer. I'm just asking you. <laughs> I mean, she. I mean, she's killed quite a few people. Um. But I don't know. I. I, I would like to think that the other animorphs would have like protected her, kind of, and like. But they never did. They never did during the series. Why would they do but it But maybe, now? you know, they would, you know, come <laughs> through at the end and be like, hey, sorry, we were wrong. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. So how does it feel knowing everything there is to know about Animorphs? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of my time now, like, reading about recent events. I haven't had a chance to like tear through every single Animorphs fan wiki and like read everything and look at all the fan art yet but uh, I was also kind of waiting for after, after this episode but yeah I don't know yeah I don't think it's hit me yet that I can just yeah. like I can look at everything now <laughs> you can just walk freely in the world now with no limits or My rules. eyes are open oh man I feel like I didn't have enough answers for you like there's a lot of stuff that you asked me that i'm like that's never really answered it's kind of (laughs) open-ended i mean a lot of stuff was tied up very nicely and other stuff was not just kind of left out of the world yeah i think applegate really likes a whole pick your own perspective kind of which is cool which is very cool it's very cool but it leaves a lot of no hard and fast rules a lot open for debate Um, I do have a question about her, though. Um, yeah. So in her letter, she mentions, like, people have been doing, like, fan fiction and stuff of her of her books. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I was actually watching a video from, like, a, a film and media critic the other day. Mm-hmm. And she was talking about... Um, her name's Sarah Z, if anyone is interested. Um, and she was talking about, like, there were... Uh, she was talking about J.K. Rowling in particular, but, like... And saying like okay. J.K. Rowling was one of the, um, the few kind of big name authors that was very welcoming and accepting of fan fiction, um, in the time period, mm-hmm. which was the early two thousands, or like late nineties, early two thousands, and like other other authors like Anne Rice, for instance, like never wanted to have fan fiction and like were were doing massive takedowns of anybody who would write fan fiction of her work and stuff like that. So. I guess my question is, was Applegate always, like, pro-fan fiction or anti-fan fiction? Or? She uh, would be pro, for sure. Okay. Um, and I don't want to, like, put words in her mouth or speak for her or pretend I know more than I do. But she is, like, with how open she's been with the Animorph series, like, she constantly promotes, you can get all the books online for free, guys. Like, yeah. look it up. Like, the PDFs are out there. Like, yeah. She is really, I think, open with that kind of stuff in general. Okay. But there's something about Animorphs in particular that she tends to, like, really be like, run with it. Okay. Like, just run with it. Cool. She seems so cool. <laughs> I, yeah. How, like, I don't, I don't know if I should talk about this, but I will and we can cut it off. <laughs> maybe. But, like, having met her now and having met both her and Michael Grant, like, there is not, (laughs) I can't think of a nicer person ever. Um, She is so sweet and so kind. And like, here, I've heard her talking about like Animorphs fans in general a few times now. Mm -hmm. And like the way that she talks, she's, she's always saying like, these are the coolest people I've ever met. Like they mm-hmm. always grow up to do amazing things. They're like writers. They're people that rehab animals. They're they're always doing interesting stuff. And like it, it I mean, if it's faked, it's very good. But like she <laughs> has a genuine love yeah. of her readers of Animorphs, and I appreciate that. And talking to Michael Grant 
is very much how I would picture talking to an older Marco would be. (laughs) (laughs) He is Marco. He's hilarious. He is Marco. He's hilarious. He's very nice. He is ready to say something like legit. I like I not to say too much, but I have talked to him and like hearing him say shit like, oh, yeah, we fucking stole that plot from Star Trek. Did you ever see this episode? It's that episode. We stole that. And, it's like, and then he'll be like, well, it wasn't the only thing we stole, but definitely that. Like, he's just, he's hilarious and completely inappropriate and wonderful. Aww. I love it so much. <laughs> so, oh, my God. Yeah. I can follow him and Afflegate on Twitter now. <laughs> you absolutely should. One thing that, um, especially during current times, I have absolutely loved about him is that he is he uses his voice to speak up on issues that like he's like listen i'm an old rich white dude Mm -hmm. let me like you know it's insane that this is happening he's like this is weird for me to say because of who i am but like he uses his voice to speak up okay and i i love that cool and applegate recently published a whole bunch of um children's lit for people of color okay. with all books that are people that are of color so you can read to your kids so sweet like they're all they're both doing like just amazing stuff overall cool they're wonderful i expect nothing less from the people that brought us gay andalites that <laughs> were disabled and how they fought for yeah their rights in their books <laughs> so yeah i was so afraid that like I would find out that like they were monsters and no. honestly they they have blown me away every time I've met them, talked to them, yeah. seen stuff they've put out there in the world. They're amazing. Aww. That's great. Oh, I'm so glad you brought Animorphs into my life. <laughs> I'm so glad you were willing to be in this two and a half year hostage situation. <laughs> oh man. Oh, shit. I am so glad you know everything. Like this, this has been so much fucking fun, and yeah. I have so enjoyed connecting with you over this series that I love so much. And it's just like, again, I've said this before, but like, I think now in my life is when I can appreciate Animorphs the most. I wish I had read them when I was younger, but I just appreciate them so much now, and. Like, the more kind of media I've been consuming, a lot of it has left me wanting, and a lot of it has been not, like, my favorite stuff because of, like, how it was written. Mm -hmm. But this series is just, like, so good. And just the way (laughs) it handles topics and the way that it's, you know, for the most part, it like brings things back and it foreshadows and it's just also very wonderful and concise and, and thorough. And I just, it's so good. And the fact that it was written in the nineties and it's like so progressive and welcoming to all. And it's just, ah, it's just so good. And it's, I mean, part of it is totally by chance. Like who knew how many of these messages needed to become cyclical and that we needed to hear them now, Mm -hmm. but also things that like we never could have predicted. Like they like Applegate and Grant totally talk about how like trans rights are, you know, necessary. Mm -hmm. They uh, are absolutely correct. And the fact that Tobias has become a kind of, flagship for that Mm -hmm. is unintentional but or unintentional but they are totally glad that that happened Mm -hmm. and they have a trans daughter and like that's it's it means so much to them too so it's almost like part of this was so unintentionally welcoming and then other parts of it are like so overt like how can you not like how can you say mean things about people that are differently abled or different than you and like it's yeah (laughs) i'm glad i read this series when i was younger Mm -hmm. especially based on like the sorts of weird types of environments that i grew up in variously having traveled through different parts of you know canada and the united states and kind of the different shit that i've run across i'm glad that i had animorphs to kind of help me Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> to give me that message to kind of stand on as opposed to things that I had learned from people that were perhaps not as well equipped to 
to give me such advice. <laughs> yeah. A really nice way of saying my parents are dicks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Animorphs with my true parents. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to say, like, that's very dramatic of a statement to make, but it definitely um, gave me a lot better ideas to stand on and a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it, ex- it expressed it in a way that I latched onto, and I am grateful for having that. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's why I, I wish I had read them when I was a kid. Um, I, I just, I think I would have latched onto the ideas and they would have stuck with me more and like influenced me as a person as I grew up. Mm -hmm. Um, so. Well, um, shit. Like, is this where we kind of like, what do we, what are our last thoughts? What are our last words? I don't know, but I'm sure I'll come up with more thoughts to have and I don't know where to direct them now. Like, <laughs> well, I we're definitely gonna have one more episode to talk about this after we've thought about it for a bit yeah. and do a Q and A. Yeah, and then we're gonna go back to the first book. Yeah, and then we'll talk about the TV show. So yeah, we have space to think about this for sure, and I think that this is a very the beginning type ending where we're like, by the way, we're coming back. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> but it feels final. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of the beginning, which is the title of this book, the subtitle. Mm-hmm. I was trying to think about what that meant. And like before I even read the book, I was like, well, what could the beginning mean? Like, are we like flashing back to the beginning? Or like, you know, you know what does this what's this gonna entail? And I was thinking about it earlier mm-hmm. when I was stretching about them going to find X and they find this like new threat and I was like oh man it's just like back to the beginning kind of with this new war and I was like that's why it's called the beginning (laughs) because we've (laughs) only just begun that's so hopeful too I love that I love that that's the way it ends and it is the beginning it's just the beginning of the next chapter and it's different and it's new and you're always gonna feel (sighs) God, what were we just talking about recently where we were like, it was Lord of the Rings. We were talking about the end of Lord of the Rings where we were like, part of the reason it's so upsetting is because it's like the fellowship has to go their separate ways. And it's just all of these people who will, they are the only ones that can understand each other and understand what each person went through. And now they're going their separate ways and they're trying to live lives where nobody will understand. And like, that's exactly what what we're doing. Yeah. Oh. Of course it's Lord of the Rings. It's always either Star Trek or Lord of it the is. Rings. I should know that by now. It is. <laughs> God. That was my last thought. Man. That was your last thought? That was my last thought about this particular book. And like I said, I'm sure I will have more thoughts as the weeks yeah. commence. But We will definitely record those next thoughts and put them down. Mm. Oh, I do have a question for you. Yeah. Somewhere along in the in the podcast recording, you mentioned that at the very end, somebody had a hyena morph. Yeah. And I guess I was totally wrong. I thought either um, Jean or uh, what's his face? Santorelli did. But I guess they never morph. And I don't know why I thought one of them had a hyena morph. Okay. But I did. Okay. Because I kept... Like, that was one thing that stuck in my brain to look out for in the final book, and, and I was waiting for it to come, and it never did. And I was like, well, did I miss something? It did. Did some of the auxiliary animorphs have it? Maybe. I don't know why I thought that. Maybe. Maybe one of the auxiliary animorphs had it, because yeah. I thought for sure somebody did. Yeah. That's that's where I expected it. I don't know. Okay, that's yeah. my last thought. <laughs> I don't know what my last thoughts are, but I can reiterate something that... I said a while ago on a completely different recording thing. And that was just, I am so glad to have had Cassie and Rachel in my life when I did, because Mm -hmm. they were, they're such strong and good examples of feminism and strong women and wonderfully written characters. And I'm so glad that I got the two of them when I did. Yeah. And I, I love that we got, just to that point, I love that we also got very 
emotionally well-rounded male characters as well. Yeah. You know, we yeah. got, especially Tobias, who was very vulnerable at all times and struggled with his own strengths and, and weaknesses. Like, apart from, like, Marco's occasional bad comments, like, all of the boys were very, like, there was no, like, toxic masculinity to be found. Like, and that's yeah. just, it was really important, I think, to show kids that they can be... They can have a variety of emotions, and they can be vulnerable, and they can cry, and that's totally fine. And and yes, having mm -hmm. two very, very strong female characters who are complex and and so different from each other, like, you know, the the quiet pacifist versus, like, the, the go-getter warrior, and just the variety of personalities in all the kids um, just was so important, I think. Just because you mentioned that about um, the toxic masculinity thing and that, I totally agree. But I, when I was mopping the floor the other day, I was thinking about early on in Rachel's books when her dad said, I didn't need a son because Rachel's better than any boy. Yeah. And I just started thinking about that and like how much like, I'm just so glad that these characters never fell into those kind of tropes or, or you know, lazy writing where they could have like the boy and girl scenarios. Mm -hmm. And I love that Rachel from start to finish always was so strong and so intense. And I'm so glad that Cassie from start to finish kept her morality. And yeah. I'm so proud of Tobias for growing the way that he did. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. From book three, where he was trying to kill himself to like book three, Tobias losing Rachel like at the end of the book would have been so shattered and he's still even though he's grumpy and he will never get over it yeah. he's still you know at that point believes in himself and like relies on himself and that's something he never could have done earlier on and i love that the growth isn't lost because of what happens it's just change yeah god i love these kids they're so good they're so good oh i kind of want to read some of athelgates and michael grant's other work yeah, I, um, I've read a few. And Front Lines, like I was talking to you about earlier, which just is like, oh my god, Animorphs plugs. But um, I've read a few of them. I have Endling to read. I bought it. I have a signed copy. Yep. It's great. This is my signed copy, too, of my book. Yay! Today. Let me... uh, but um, I've read, like, Crenshaw. I've read Wish Tree. I've read a lot of her other stuff. And, like... Wish Tree in particular, I think, was really, really fucking good. Hmm. I would recommend that one. Okay. It's not at all like Animorphs in any <laughs> way, but I would recommend that yes. one. It's very good. Okay. And I've read Gone. And Gone was not... I had troubles relating to Gone. Okay. That's a Michael Grant one. Um, and it was very good. But I, I wasn't in love with any of the characters. And it's a nine-part series. I've only read the first one gotcha. so far. I know. I just don't want to leave yet. It feels like once we stop, it'll really... <laughs> come to an end but, and i don't want to but we're not i mean, I mean we're done with this we're series. not done we're we're, we're done with the series but we have so much more to go yeah but i don't want to hang up because then it like <laughs> i feel like right now we're sustaining the memory of our dear friends and once we hang up we'll have to be forced to confront the reality that we're done with this series and we're going to be watching the tv show now which is a different fucking animal <laughs> 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 oh my god i'm so excited for the tv show <laughs> oh my god it's so bad good it's so bad good oh. for sure good bad bad good it's so good i it's gonna be super weird for you because you've only seen one episode to watch boris cabrera knowing that we have talked to that <laughs> man it's going to be so weird for you because <laughs> i've done it and i'm like oh my god we know him <laughs> oh my god oh. <laughs> i couldn't help god. but at the end when marco was narrating and he was like oh yeah i'm a movie star now like i'm doing this show about us the animorphs Same. and i was like he is boris cabrera <laughs> Same at the end, especially when he was older and like giving that speech to Jake. Like, no, you listen to me now. I'm like, oh, this is Boris giving that <laughs> speech. I'm pretty sure. That's amazing. <laughs> oh. oh, God. Okay, I've delayed for so long. 
Okay, for real, any final thoughts? For real, for real. I'm good. For real. You're good? For now. I guess this is the part of the episode where we tell people to email us at anonymousanimorphs at gmail.com or to follow us on Twitter at Animorphs Anon or Instagram at Animorphs Anonymous or go on Facebook and find our, our Animorphs Anonymous group or our super secret, super awesome Andalite Bandalites page, which is facebook.com slash group slash Animorphs Anonymous. And if you join that group, you can find out how to get onto our super awesome Discord channel. And um, if you don't want to join that group and you want to just have the link to the Discord, you can email us or... Hit us up on Twitter or whatever. I'll hook you up. Yeah, and I'll send that over to you for show. If you want to listen to all the podcasts we've ever done, <laughs> you can find all of them on all of the podcast sites that are currently available now. God, they get to the end of this marathon and then we're like, by the way, there's fucking more. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. If you're sick of listening to podcasts and want to read a comic, Casey, tell me what comic I can read. I have a web comic. It's called Beside You. Please go check it out at B S I D E Y O U comic dot com. Just just do it. <laughs> if you become a patron, you'll know that Slater's back. The best character Slater of all time. <laughs> I Casey says differently. She's like, no, Slater's not the best character. She's wrong. He is. <laughs> He's such an asshole coming up though. He's gonna be such a dick. He's he's great. I, was, I love No, him. I was tying down some pages the other day and I was just looking at his face and I'm like, you're being such a dick right now. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Oh. I love it. If you like other people that are dicks talking about shit, <laughs> then you can find me as an accidental third host sometimes of From Cadmus to Crisis, it's, it's a Superboy podcast. Where we talk about the 90s comic Superboy, and he's in Hawaii right now, and the uh, main ally for him is a former exotic dancer, maybe current exotic dancer, I haven't read it, but she could be, I'm not judging, (laughs) she's awesome, she's my favorite character of all time, honestly the biggest badass ever, so... Um, you can listen to David and Drew from our Alternamers episode talk about that, and then sometimes me, by accident. I'm sorry, I know nothing about Superboy. <laughs> that's all. That's all. <laughs> I feel like I should have prepared a song or something. So long, farewell. I think there's... I'll be the singer. I'll be the singer. <laughs> or... I think there's only one possible way we can end this. Uh-oh. Just tell me when you're ready to hit the button, and I'll tell you the only possible way we can end this. Oh, okay. I'm ready. Casey, ram the blade ship. <laughs>